From beyond the farthest reaches of our galaxy they come. Two brains pulsing with a strange energy. These space brains come to share their love of science fiction movies. Welcome to Space Brains, the show where we joy watch sci-fi movies and then talk about what was good and what was great. I'm Surrey and this is Mark. Hiya. Tonight we're talking about The Darkest Dawn. It's a 2016 film directed by Drew Casson. He also wrote the film with Jesse Cleaver and both of them actually star in the film. So consider this your spoiler warning. Turn back now if you haven't seen this movie. But then tune back in and hear what we have to say. So, sorry, what's your number one takeaway from this movie, The Darkest Dawn? Uh, number one takeaway from this movie is that even in today's modern age, where telephones are the main source of filming, people still get video cameras and film themselves incessantly. <laughs> yeah, and she's excited about it. She's a 16-year-old girl and she's very excited about a video camera. Well, she's going to be a journalist. It's a digital video camera. It it's, not, it's not the VHS tapes, but, you know... Well, there you go. So, so that, well, that's good. It's always nice to know that there are still young kids who yep. are looking to improve yep. themselves and get well, on. Maybe that's a sign of the time because a lot of the people in this, the, a lot of the actors, sorry, I shouldn't say people, a lot of the actors in this film, you know, we found out after watching this. we don't this, consider actors to be people. No, we don't. We don't. Clear. They're not on the same page. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actors that are portraying these characters, and they do it really well in this film, but... They're all YouTubers. They were not people I'd specifically heard of before watching this film. Again, we go in cold with these films. Or, or, you know, we both do. We go yeah. in. We don't really know much about it. Afterwards, sort of check them out, Google them, etc. And, yeah, apparently they're all YouTube sensations, which is which is amazing. And so I think the filmmakers, producers, have, they've, they've leaned on that in to, to, to get this film made, you know, the fact that they are... They've already got a ready-made audience out there, and that's very clever, you know, with a bit of an indie film. So you're sort of saying, hey, who do the young people look to now? YouTubers. Okay, why don't we get them in, in a film that's kind of, you know, playing off YouTube anyway with a, with a video, with camera. video camera. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, maybe the YouTubers do use video cameras. Probably. They probably. probably do, yeah. I, I've, I mean, <laughs> I've made a couple of YouTube videos They've been with my phone. Yeah, I think that's the amateur hour, sorry. You're in the amateur league. These guys are professionals. They use cameras. They're taking it serious. I've only got two subscribers to my channel, so yes, it is a bit (laughs) amateur there. Fair enough. There we go. But uh, how about you, Mark? What do you think? Was this a warning, a hope, or an experiment? I'm a little bit confused about this one. I think experiment, and I did want to kind of ask you what you thought about it, but... I mean, because if you think about those three categories, it's it's kind of not hope, and then it's not really uh, yeah, it's not really an experiment either because it's kind of abstract with an alien invasion. So I kind of put it sorry so, yeah, it's not sorry a warning. Sorry, I'm I'm thinking more experiment, but yeah, I am a bit unsure about it. Yeah, because it wasn't like there was. The, the characters in this film didn't do anything wrong. You know, like quite often they people do something wrong. Yeah, if we take other life, she was, you know, Ren was chopping between, you know, testing the reality of biology and she's pushing the ethical extremes for her br- brother in the coma. The, no one in this film really did anything wrong. The and, aliens and just the came. primary thrust of the other world was that, that prison, solitary yes, confinement. Yes, that's right. Which again, yep. you're sort of going, yeah, is, that a, quite is that actually ethical. a good usage yeah, of it? Or is yep. that sort of missing out on the full benefits exactly i I think experiment as well because you're not really being warned against no i suppose you might say a bit of human nature but it's more i thought more of an experiment of like okay we'll grab a bunch of guys teenagers and and early 20s uh, i would say and stick them in this sort of extreme environment yep uh and and then meeting other people and so we're, we're seeing how they first of all meet up and how they relate how they come together but then how they interact with other areas and how they have to, I guess, learn when to be ruthless and when to be 
uh, compassionate. Yeah. That's sort uh, of an experiment there. Yeah. So th- I, I, that's why I was leaning and that's why I kind of put a bit of a question mark. So it'd be great to know if anyone out there watches this film, they could hit us up and let us know. Uh, even, you know, the filmmakers themselves could let us know, did they intend for this to be an experiment or was it more of a warning? I don't know. So or is it hopeful? I'm not too sure. We're talking to you, Drew. <laughs> we are talking to you, Drew Casson. Yeah. Yeah, well, and or Jess who, Cleverly, he yeah, also Jess, co-wrote yeah, it. Yeah, go for it. And as always, you can get us at Space Brains Pod on Twitter. You certainly can. And that's what they said with this movie, The Darkest Dawn, that if you want to reach out to them after watching it, Twitter is their handle. So, yeah, anyone else out there, you can also reach out to them, apparently, if you watch the film. Tell them how awesome it is. So are you up to anything yourself, personally, apart from watching these great science fiction films? Sorry? Uh, writing book two. Awesome. I'm editing uh, a Space Brains episode. <laughs> yes, very good, down. very good, very important. <sighs> oh, I actually just finished season two uh, of Exit Plan. So Exit Plan season two finale happened. And that's another podcast. That's uh, another podcast. Yes, I'm, I get a little breather from that. On the in lines of more sort of science fiction, I've actually sort of, well, I finished watching that uh, Love, Death and Robots. Yeah, very good All series. That that one. Yeah, I love that. That is well worth the effort to watch. Yeah, definitely. But no, at the moment, I'm kind of watching... Oh, you know what I am doing, though? Is I'm putting together... I've, I've come across a few people on Reddit who have and uh, said they want to write some science fiction right. stories. But they've only really written fantasy, and so they're not really sure where to start most of it. And as it turns out, I have a, a framework or a method that I go through to, to come up with ideas. So I'm thinking about... Writing, I've already written, I've made some videos on it, but I'm thinking of, of writing a bit more of a, an ebook sort of bit of information pack about it, just um, a good idea. to share the way I produce yeah. ideas yep. and maybe it'll help someone. And maybe from what we've seen from The Darkest Dawn, you should YouTube those those hints. Get your mug on a video well, camera, I've, I've got some, some little videos. tips. Yeah, yeah, but we should be putting that. There. Maybe that's it. Become a YouTuber. And then you can yeah. leap into acting as part know, of your I'm resume. I'm kind of all full up with, with podcast and writing <laughs> at the moment. Uh, I will. Never say I, never. Good idea. Chuck a camera up, film me doing all of that. Yeah, fil- film us podcasting might be the way to go for in the forward. <laughs> I have to wear clothes. <laughs> oh, no. Don't reveal our secrets, sorry. Well, I'm wearing, I am wearing clothes. As He's opposed not. to pyjamas. So I'm wearing my pyjamas. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, well, actually for me, I did some filming. I'm, I can, you know, that was good fun on the weekend. I was filming that little micro doco I mentioned the previous time. Drumming circle? Yeah, drumming yeah. circle stuff. So not at all sci-fi, but it was great to get behind the camera. It's been a little while. So yeah, it kind of gets your creative juices going and makes you want to get out there and film a whole bunch of other stuff like The Darkest Dawn. I think it's quite inspiring that these guys went out and, you know, filmed this probably in a really quick turnaround time real low budget, but yet it's now out there, you know, on a mainstream worldwide provider like Netflix. So great work there, Drew. Um, For myself, I sort of had a little aha actually just the other day. I had a little sci-fi short film come to me, but then I've thought about it more and more, and I reckon that it may be a series. Should I have to do that again? Or should we just get Maybe a series. Yeah. Tell us about the series idea you have, Mum. Well, so I had a bit of an aha moment that I wrote a little short film. It's totally sci-fi. So like a little experiment film between two people in sort of like a government lab and, and it plays out just as a little short film, probably three to four minutes. And I've, I've been dwelling on it for a few days. And I kind of like it. I like the idea. It's really sci-fi. And then I, but then today I had a bit of an aha, not today, sorry. Yes, I had a bit of an aha of actually that could, same idea, like an experiment from a science lab could actually be like a little series, you know? So a little bit like you said, love, death and robots, the the, the connection there is love, love, death and robots, but the connection for these little films would be experiments on people. Mm. So it'd be like, you know, pushing people to different extremes. So, yeah, I'm kind of a bit excited about that. So today I was sort of brainstorming what some of those experiments could be. Yeah. yeah so a, what, an overarching sort of theme to the experiments like some sort of well i think uh, it would be that these people are getting treated pretty badly by the government (laughs) it'd be testing humanity you know it'd be not the nicest things to these people you know so uh, hey if it bleeds it leads it works so i'm going for that angle i reckon but yeah early stages just just 
just a pure creative idea that's come to me, but I'm a bit excited by it. I think I've never really had that idea of a series before. You know, it's always been standalone ideas. Yeah. So just that well, sort of... I think also now when you're looking at places like you, uh, Netflix, no, not Netflix, well, Netflix, well, yeah, Netflix but, yeah, yeah. I mean, YouTube, yeah. being able to publish... Uh, you know your videos it's quite good to have like a little yeah, series people right. will follow along uh, you'll get feedback and yeah uh, yeah you, you can sort of try out your different different ideas and you can experiment on people watching mm. it's well. funny that in a way short film has kind of come around in a circle because of the internet you know like it almost was a uh, you know it was there on the festival circuit for a long time and it still is but now it's like but beyond that, there wasn't much short films could do, whereas things like Netflix and even just online portals, even just YouTube, it's a way of people getting out there. Apparently, Drew, the director of this film, you know, that's what he did. He, he, he'd made a bunch of short films just in his backyard, his parents' backyard, and they were very sci-fi, and that's what got him a little bit noticed, you know, and, and mm. gave him a, a bit of a credential to move forwards to make a feature, you know, so good on him for doing that. And that's... That's predominantly what short films have been about. But I think now you can, you know, if it's a five, six, eight little short series and there's a theme with it all, an overarching theme, and but then, they the are nice a bit thing different. also is you can actually get some special effects in there now. Yeah. I'm mean, just on your own computer here. I've, my The videos I've done, I've used green screen to, to wipe out my dodgy looking granny flat that I work in uh, to, to put in sort of fantastic background so yep. at least there's something interesting to look at uh, and certainly as you, you know I've got I've actually downloaded for computer game writing uh, I'm making a computer game it's sort of a bit on hiatus at the moment while I deal with all this other stuff <laughs> too many creative things do at once <laughs> but yeah you can get packs of pre-created characters yeah. and, and just sort of stick them in yeah, yeah. and you can certainly do that at, at, at a really quite affordable price point. Definitely, definitely. You know, it makes it more um, practical, hands-on. So we probably should talk a little bit about the plot and the cast. We've mentioned Drew and Jess, who have worked together previously, and that they, Drew Casson is the director of The Darkest Dawn, and he also co-wrote it with Jess Cleverly. Um, both star in the film. Drew is Cohen, and Jess is Mr. Murdoch. So um, that's basically who the roles they play in the film. And they both come in at different parts during the story. And it's essentially a bunch of very talented and successful YouTubers, singers, comedians, actors, and real online talent get to play out in this film. So I think it's a really clever way of, of casting a modern day film, especially a film like this where the intention is not probably the traditional, you know, go to the cinemas, you know, go to the festival circuits. It's, Purely for the online environment. It works well online. I actually, if we're going to talk about just before the plot, there, my viewing, I watched yep. this on my phone. Yep. On the train, and I think that actually resulted in a better experience it, than watching it on a big screen. Yep. Because it is shot from the point of view of a handy cam, a digital yep. camera, and there's a lot of so you know, there's a lot of movement. It's a point of view type of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of quick cuts. Like yeah. As popular on YouTube, there's these invisible cuts where literally the scene will be there and then there will be the very next frame, everyone's in slightly different positions yeah. and they're talking about something totally different. That's right, yeah. Just like uh, no doubt many of these, these guys on YouTube done, do yeah. in fact themselves. And it, it's become acceptable online to just, you know, you and I are having a conversation now and we just cut out a minute. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't really matter if we were sitting down, then we're standing up. Like, it's ex totally acceptable. Mm. <laughs> and, of course, a film like this where it is just a handheld camera, supposedly, that she's dragging around the place, uh, you're, you're allowed to do that again, you know, because so, you're just pressing pause and record again. Yeah, so yeah. It, it worked really well on my phone watching yeah. it uh, on the train. It, it, got, it had that feeling of, uh, I suppose, more reality. To yeah. It. It, I, it felt more like I was watching a video someone had actually taken and posted online. Mm. Whereas going to the cinema, uh, I think you go to the cinema and you see this big room with a great big sound and a big screen, that same sort of moving camera and sudden cuts, odd angles and so forth might be a bit distracting. You yeah. must have be wanting to see larger expanses of terrain and you know because you've got this great big screen in front of your eyeballs, but on a smaller screen where in fact my a hand was moving, jolting around with the train. It really meshed well. Yeah, and I'm glad you watched it like that because I watched it um, on my laptop 
And I was going to, I was actually going to say, I've got in my notes that people should watch this on their laptop or mobile phone. Like mm. it felt, it, it, I felt more drawn to it. And I agree. I think on a large screen, uh, you, it might be a bit too much, you know, because we are yeah. super close up on their faces. We don't get to see a lot of the details. And, and, and I love all that for this story. I love that, that portrayal in this film. And, but I, I was going to recommend to anyone out there, if you haven't seen it or you, did watch it, watch it on a mobile device. I, I reckon it works. I reckon it really does. I think yeah. these guys have nailed the point of view sort of thing. And, and many films have done that. And I reckon these these guys here have nailed it. And it's probably because it's their trade. <laughs> They're yeah, YouTubers. I've, they know what works. A, you lot, know? a lot of the yeah, a lot of the action, a lot of the camera moves, the camera shots really remind me a lot of of YouTube. Yeah. Because yeah. I've like everyone else, end up yeah. down a YouTube you, hole. You do watch, yeah. Yeah, 11 o'clock at night. You're <laughs> supposed to be going to bed, but then you see on the sidebar, you go, yeah, yeah, yeah another like, one, another the, one. The Slingshot Channel. <laughs> you ever seen the Slingshot Channel? No. This this weird German dude builds incredible, fantastic sort of slingshot type weapons. And okay. Things where, like Fair crossbows enough. and uh, shooting saw blade things. And the kind of things that take dragons out of the sky? But quite possibly, <laughs> but it's always handheld and he... He laughs constantly, has this really strong German accent. It's mm. entertaining just for that. Well, but you're exactly right. That's what YouTube does. You get sucked into the vortex yeah, and, and, and you so look you, at that next thing, you're, yeah, yeah. You're you used to seeing about get, yeah. three minutes, four minutes, and then yeah. something entirely something different. Else, yeah. uh, a different angle, a different yeah. approach, everything. Bang. So it's almost like the modern day audience, because of things like YouTube and other, other sites, we're used to things jumping and changing so mm. rapidly aren't we you know i mean old movie filmmaking theory it, you didn't have to show everything it goes right back to einstein's and um eisentine sorry where so yeah, einstein. not einstein is yeah he, a he is part of this yeah but the russian filmmaker and it's like you know his classic film of like slicing the eyeball and he goes to slice the eyeball and he sl- and then we have a shot straight away of the moon being cut and uh by a cloud and it's like the audience goes ah because you just you couldn't mm. you can't help but fill in the blanks, you know. Yeah. And filmmaking's done that forever since then. And but it's almost like the modern day audience. We can even take it another step in a way because of YouTube that we can fill in those blanks really rapidly because we don't need it all spelled out. So we're used to the camera being jolted around and even even not very professional, you know, like the camera being shaky. And we kind of go, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Well, they're <laughs> we're not, used to it. It's all right. It's the good okay. thing is that's what it's supposed to be in this. Yeah, it's, in this uh, film, it's supposed to be like that, yeah. And I, I have to say that if I was going to be, and I'm sure I will make a film at some point, it would definitely have to incorporate some way to explain why it's not a high, you know, end James Cameron-esque or, or Weta yeah. developed yes. multi-camera system with 60,000 frames per second and so forth, you know. Definitely, and we'll come, we'll come back a bit to the reason probably why this was point of view later. So what about the plot? Do you want me to start it off and you chime in a little bit as we go along? Yeah, you start it. Okay, this, so this we have 16-year-old Chloe. She gets a camera. I actually quite liked this opening scene, and she wants to be a, blo- a vlogger, sorry, and we meet the family, and they're all like a little nice, tight bunch family. We've got mum, dad, sister, Sam, and, of course, Chloe, and she's turning 16. Very quickly we get this this happening and there's also then a scene of her and her mum uh, going where she's donating her o and o blood group uh, type and then suddenly and I, personally i love this that mm. then the next thing you know her and her dad are watching the tv news and there's some sort of uh, event happening with an soldiers explosion, an explosion and, yeah. terrorism event kind of nothing major and mum, they, you know, the husband asks uh, his wife, the dad asks the mum, you know, I don't think you should go to work. And she shrugs it off. He's a bit worried, but, you know, she goes, she goes off. And then again, we, we're jumping very quickly that he's even more worried and he's on the phone to the police or something like that. And they're not interested. And then it, it jumps again. And, and we're sort of now being told that uh, the aliens are attacking or there's some sort of military evacuation happening. I'm not too sure if there is aliens. No, there is aliens because it's yeah, a TV the, the screen TV. of a big spaceship. Yeah, it's, it's this is part of the whole sudden cut. Yeah, like that's right. Really hard, really, really quickly. Quick. Yeah. No, uh, no establishing no, shot. It's just no. it's jump, jump, mum jump. off to work, or maybe you shouldn't go. But we never see mum again. <laughs> and then, bang! It's like, oh, I'm really worried. And yeah. I even got the feeling 
that wasn't that same day. It was no, actually I've, she'd been going to yeah, work, yeah, and things have been progressing worse. Yes, but and now they're suddenly worried because, but it, it's just kind of yeah, slams in some, and then there's like explosion Hungerford, yeah, that, or cut cut, and yeah. then it's just like aliens are attacking. There's no yeah. slow build up, no, no. like in a, in a Hollywood film where it's like, well, you think War of the Worlds, you know, like the Sp- Spielberg one, you know, they we we learn a lot about Tom Cruise, don't we? You know, yeah, we learn well, a lot about his son and the and the world they live in, and and then and then the aliens kind of appear, and we sort of see a lot of that, and then they're coming out of the ground and all that sort of stuff, and then. And then there's, you know, then there's drama. But then even then it's not evacuate time. You know, it's like, oh, okay, what are we going to do? Whereas this film is just jump, 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 you know. Yeah. And again, we'll talk about it with good scenes, but I, I reckon it's a great scene is the military asking them to leave. And the so the dad and Sam and Chloe, they, you know, rush out of the house. And I think she trips over as well. And we're seeing chaos in the neighbourhood. We're seeing soldiers evacuating people. Um, there's explosions, there's noises, and they sort of dodge a plane crash that comes over their head, like a massive plane comes bearing down over their head and sort of burns up in the distance. Um, and then with that as well, there's, there is a spaceship. There's an alien spaceship coming across them. Uh, and with her dad trying to help Chloe, she uh, suddenly this... We so, don't really get to see much of it, but like a bug kind of jumps onto his head, I suppose. And with that, a soldier shoots him dead. Yeah, bang. and and again, I like you know this was really hooking me because I was thinking, wow, the dad's just dead like that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know? It's just like it was really, and the soldier just walked away. Well, it wasn't like any sort of you know again heroic. Oh, come with me, little girl, and you know, yeah. I've, you know I've shot your dad, but I'm going to save the day. It was no man down, move on to the next one. You know, so there was a bit of ruthlessness going on. Uh, this angry man, I think um, uh, Bob, is uh, appears and he helps the two girls. And again, he just looks like another neighbour or something. And they end up in these tunnels uh, underground where supposedly they're a bit safer. We can hear lots of noises above, explosions and yelling and fire, uh, firing of weapons and things like that. And uh, they are bunkered underground with this, with this man. He, he's a bit angry at times. With them, he's not happy that Chloe's mourning her father and also that she's holding hope for her mum still to come back. He, he kind of like kicks her candles over and he tells her not yeah, to pray. Bob, and Bob was a bit uptight. Yeah. and there's Understandably, the, but nonetheless. Yeah, but he's looking after them because they run out of water and he goes off and gets water. And it, it, I think it's implied as well that maybe the older sister is, you know, sexually helping him. or him down. Yeah, she says calming down. We don't really know. But there's sort of some sort of impression that she's keeping the peace between the two of them. Um, and then all of a sudden, they hear a bit more immediate noise and three men rock up, three young men. Uh, we have Cohen, Adam and Kipper. There's a great little scene where they sort of hold each other's, you know, with guns to each other, not sure who they are. But they manage to kind of, Cohen manages to calm the scenario and, and get through it. They help each other, they talk, Cohen talks with the girls, they kind of seem to be okay, Bob seems to be okay, they want to rest up and then the next day they're going. And the key thing as well is Adam is searching for his sister and as you said, they came from Hungerford Mm. and they wanted to, they came out of Hungerford like running out of it as it was exploding, they were helped out by the military and uh, pretty much left a you know a bomb site behind them, not much behind them. But they were hopeful that Adam's sister would be uh, here or alive or at a, at a base. They thought there was a military base nearby, so they sort of rest up. And then overnight, Bob he gets angry, more angry, and he attacks them. And I think he is it Cohen. He tries to kill, maybe. Yes. Yeah, I think he tries to kill him, and then Adam kind of. And Sam and Chloe, they kind of all attack him a little bit. And Adam ends up killing uh, Bob. Uh, again, really well done with the camera because it's off camera. You know, it's just some feet twitching. Yeah, he gets dragged <laughs> I like that. He rope, kind of gets dragged. And, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And we sort of see Adam's then like, you know, he wants to gag over it kind of thing. Um, they decide to move on and they're going, they're looking for this military base that they heard about. Again, they're hoping that they get there, then they'll be safe. They might find Adam's sister. Um, and But what they sort of, after going through some dark tunnels, they discover this base is empty. It's been deserted. Uh, it's been fled. And they sort of learn through some paperwork and the way uh, the radio is going, I think, that um, they only left maybe a day earlier and they'll go in for a rendezvous 
two days walk from where they are. There's also a dying doctor and they try to talk to her, try to help her. And she circles a big O around Manchester. Manchester. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, it's a nice place, Manchester. Yeah, I, but I, that, <laughs> I was a bit confused by that, but then I thought, well, okay, okay, something must mean something. Uh, something about that scene, there was a the pickup weapons there. Yes, that's another thing, yeah. And the, one of the first establishing shots when they came into the base as the camera's moving around, there is a fully loaded G36, HK G36, which okay. is a, it's a beautiful German assault. Well, you rifle. would know these weapons, yeah. Of, you seem to be in them. <laughs> The man in the pajamas and into weapons. A high, yeah, <laughs> a high quality German assault rifle, fully loaded, just sitting there. And instead, he takes like what looks like a an old M1 carbine and a <laughs> broken down AK of some sort. You know, like yeah. Why oh, they look cool? They look why, cool. Why would? Yeah, I, I mean, it suits the post-apocalyptic look rather than that futuristic. Thing over. These guys are YouTubers. They're, they're concerned I, of the look. This is I would the... have been. I would have been taking the superior weapon there. Well, but... someone that doesn't know much about weapons, I wouldn't have a clue. So no, I okay, need no, you there to tell me. No, take that weapon. You know, it had the but... laser optic sights. and no, everything. So you... it was just why do you need any of they're that? They're sitting there waiting. Do you know what it was? A beautiful piece of computer graphics. I reckon. Yeah, probably. They're probably. A bit expensive to get a hold of one of those for for your props just lying yeah, around. Yeah, never know. Or maybe well, they, maybe they could get one in there. But it was not rugged enough for the sort of action they're going to be putting through. They yeah. wanted something made of wood and a bit hardier, which, which the other two weapons were. Maybe they could only borrow that for that particular day, yeah. shoot, and then that's it. So. But, like, <laughs> yeah, as you said, though, it, it really did suit the scene better, yeah. taking the wooden... And and the guns with the wooden stocks and the bits and pieces on it looked... I didn't notice any difference, cooler. but maybe if someone out there is listening and they're like, sorry, and into guns, they can message us and I, let I us know. I'm what into guns. <laughs> well, you know the type of gun yeah, that sure. should be used in Apocalypse. So you'd be handy. You'd be handy in this group mm. scenario. You'd probably get killed pretty quickly in the plot. I would because almost certainly you would, die. You would instantly. help the hero choose the right gun and then you'd be dead. Yeah, I'd do something else stupid like yeah. stop to have a little bit of this old piece of <laughs> Look at this computer. Oh, this is so cool. Hang yeah. on. I'm let me take it apart. <laughs> What's behind the computer? Aliens. Yeah, uh, aliens, of course. <laughs> yeah, what do you expect? So they, after that, they leave the tunnel. They're not sure what the O in... They, I think they thought... Uh, no, actually, I think they thought that it, it was the danger zone. Don't go to Manchester. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> although I was sort of asking, where's Philippa? And so, yeah. so there was some... Uh, yeah. I'm, in my mind, I'm going, is she saying the new evacuation point is Manchester? That's right. Or that they have to get... Away from Manchester from, or yeah, away, away from, from Manchester. Manchester. Yeah, it wasn't but, very clear. Um, and they do have a code name, don't they? Ascalon. Yes, that's it. I knew you'd remember that. Um, and so they leave the tunnel. They emerge out into the daylight. And, of course, it's a destroyed London. Um, and they're sort of standing there and there's buildings blown apart, apartments, missing levels. And for us foreigners, we know it's London. Because there was a red double-decker bus that was There broken. was, yeah, right in, in the vicinity, wasn't it? It was, like, blown up. And I think maybe that weird... There is a name of that London building. You know that sort of glass tower? Oh, was, it, was it the... Because it's a bit iconic shard. now. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they're using Doctor Who a lot. They do, they do. It's, I mean, look, London's not yeah. a big, tall is city. Is it the Shard like, or is it the... I don't know. I don't like know. That. I honestly don't. Anyway... <laughs> If, if you're watching, if you're listening and you're from uh, the London, UK, let us know. London, you tell us, you know, because we'll get it wrong. I <laughs> know uh, we will. It's not an old building, but it's an iconic building now of London. There's not many tall buildings in London. It's not their thing. Um, Kipper finds a boat, you know, and they decide to go upstream. And this is another bit I kind of liked. When they're going plodding down the river, the the destruction that was, a, you know, littered along the riverbank. You know, mm, there, was a, yeah, the there was a burnt out yeah, helicopter, helicopter. There was yeah. cars. There was trucks. There's things floating in the river. You know, the housing that they sort of look at has been looted and burnt and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, I loved that. I love Because mm. quite often that's the thing with end of the world stories like this one. Uh, that's, that's, that's the best bits, isn't it? That's the voyeurism as an audience. It's like, what would it be like to walk down your city with no one else around and it's all blowing up? And one all that of the sort best of stuff? scenes in 28 Days Later, yeah. when he comes out of the hospital and London, London is deserted. London is deserted, yeah, yeah. Uh, and apparently that took quite a bit of effort to organise. <laughs> and they only had like a very brief window yep. to get as many shots. So they used lots of cameras simultaneously to get as many shots as they could. Yeah. Because the chances of getting the London streets empty like that, very low. Right. But it well, was quite so often, effective. Yeah, quite often. Like I know that movie did it and other movies do it. What you have to do, that Cameron Crowe movie, um, Vanilla Sky does it as mm. well, Tom Cruise. Like 
you have to literally a little bit like a fun run you have to block city block you know you have to block city streets off mm. and no one that doesn't make anyone happy in the whole world so you know you've got residents you've got businesses etc they don't want you know even if you're a big film crew from hollywood they don't want you taking away businesses and re- residents want to get to their home Almost or whatever especially if yeah, you're yeah. a big hollywood that's film right crew. especially so it's like okay you can block it off on a sunday morning at 6 a.m to 7 a.m that's what we'll give you and that's it and it will cost you this much and you're gonna be quiet and you're gonna be quiet <laughs> So they've got to do it very quickly. It might take six Sundays in a row at 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. Boom, you know. So it's a tough gig. Uh, but we knew this was destroyed London because of... The double-decker bus. Double-decker bus. It's, it's the only way we know what London is from Australia because we don't have them here. And uh, so they go along that river and it's great. It's all littered with destruction and rubbish and all those sorts of things you'd expect. And again, with the jump in, we, we know that a bit of time's going by. And so they, they sort of decide to stop for food. They go to this really random big old house. To me, it didn't really look very English, that house, actually. Um, sort of looked a bit more like Alabama or something in America. But anyway. It did look a bit plantation. It, it suddenly looked very different to me, that place. But that was just my imagination. I, st- I still we, was going with the story. And I have to say, we're not exactly experts of what countryside, canal side homes no. look like in no. England. No, and that can look all de- uh, weird. I remember going up the Swan River here from Perth to... I used to live in Bassendee and we did that ferry tour. Mm. And uh, suddenly I'm like, what? Where are we? Where the hell are we? You know, we were near my home and I could not really tell when you're then on the river chugging along in a little ferry boat, where are we? (laughs) I didn't recognise the houses from that side because, you know, we don't live in the big plantation style million dollar mansion sort of overlooking the river. Not yet. When Space Brains takes off. Yes, when this place, yes. We'll have to start charging these 10 users some money, I think. (laughs) Um, So they discover an old house. There's not much food or in fact there's no food and but then they hear some creaking, groaning. They go upstairs. They discover a really old man. He's sort of holding his dead, I think she's dead, in the bed. Um, And he, he offers them an apple and they take it. And he, Adam gives him a gun, and when they're sort of arguing, Cohen and Adam are arguing over the apple, giving the, the old man back the apple, he commits suicide. So I suppose in that, it's a good little beat of the film that, well, it's a pretty desperate world they're in, you know, reminding us of this Armadillo. And really from there, things get worse, you know. So they get back on yeah. the, the boat, and they're all a bit sad, and they share that one little apple. And... A little boy comes out screaming in for help about his parents and they, they stop because, again, they're really nice little millennials, these these guys in the film. And um, they go in to help. And Adam's the only one that holds back. And, in fact, it is a trap. And it's these pretty sinister yeah. men. I don't, it wouldn't have worked with Gen Xs. You know, no. I would have taken one look at a I think we little kid asked me for help. Shot down like, the kid. I, I barely even Mowing helped my, down. I barely even helped my own kids. I'm mean, like, <laughs> come on. You would have just steered that boat the other way. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Good Help luck us. with the aliens. Yeah. Um, probably either way you'd get shot at by these people. Yeah, right? If I the trip didn't think work, I think you'd be in, in trouble. Uh, there's a bit of a violent standoff between them and uh, Chloe is kind of going to be picked. And again, men being men, we're not too sure what they're going to do to her. And Adam comes in and just brutally kind of shoots them and she brutally stabs Paul, uh, the actor Paul, yeah, the actor playing Paul. Brian. Um, and yeah. he, she just brutally stabs him like about 18 times, doesn't she, I think? Yeah, she goes a bit mental. With yeah, she goes life. really mental, you know, um, and takes him out. And they. And I presumed as well they killed the kid. I think I think Adam killed the kid, didn't he? Because he was holding the camera and the camera light dropped. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, so I think they killed the kid. It's mm. really clever. I think they shot the kid, but we don't see it because the kid was holding the camera. Because as brutal as the film is... There are some lines you don't want to cross That's right. yeah. easily. You, yeah. don't, you don't want to just casually nah. cross the child murder nah. line. These were millennials, not Gen Xs. <laughs> <laughs> Chainsaw Massacre era, we would just... <laughs> That's right. Um, and then, anyway, so they're on the boat. Obviously, it's a bit sombre. And all of a sudden, up on this bridge ahead of them, there's this crazy bunch of... I don't know if they're ex-soldiers or... Yeah. And what? they're just like, you know, mowing them down kind of thing. Oh, I was seeing that. I was thinking, what the heck's going on? Oh, no, because a tank. A tank rolled up and started bringing its gun to bear and there's some dudes like... Like preaching? Yeah, some guys like preach into the sky and then, and then, and then they start firing on them. Uh, so our lovely troop, you know, they say, get off, get it. They sort of hop off the boat. And then the alien ship is actually there. 
and everything is kind of annihilated. And I know you and I have talked about this previously. And when we get to the science bit later, I'm, I'm looking forward to what you have to say about it. But and and it's part of the big crux of the plot of this film as well as this this mil- the weapons that the aliens suddenly have because. I guess in you going back to, you know, the decision of choosing a particular gun, in this scene we see the power of the alien ship uh, in that these guys just get annihilated, you know, and everything is just kind of zapped and shot and blown up. And One of the great things about this gun that the aliens use is it's relatively selective of living things. Mm. Like it does cause a bit of an explosion. It does blow some bricks and stuff about the place. But it is hunting something that is breathing. They're not you know, shooting like, a, um, uh, you know, a great big explosive thing which uh, blows craters in the ground. Yeah, yeah. It's going, well, I, I need to kill things with yeah. minimal damage. It does. It knocks a couple of buildings down here yeah. and there. But overall, it's mostly just living stuff that explodes. It's designed so, to kill the living, yeah. It's quite a clever little Because mm. then it leaves environment. It, it makes sense because a lot of times in science fiction they introduce a science fiction weapon which seems to be less effective and less useful than a conventional weapon. Yeah. But, like, <laughs> or, or it's just like more powerful, isn't it? You know, it's a, it's a nuclear bomb times ten, you know, yeah, and that's all it is. You know, like it's not... A classic example is in Star Wars with the Stormtrooper weapons. Mm. Yeah, a normal modern assault rifle, far more accurate, far more effective and useful than this little thing. <laughs> She's like, ba-doo, 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 and so, yeah. yeah, that's right. Just doesn't do and much. Like, it? Just use a conventional weapon, you'd be better off, man. Did you just shoot me with one of them? I've, yeah. I've got to put my hand under the water. I've got to get some cold water running over yeah, it. You've given me a burn. But these aliens... <laughs> these aliens were more it's just Because they, they're saying, well, we want to keep the planet. I assume they want to keep the planet, but we don't really need these pesky humans running around, so we'll just make a gun that... Largely kills people. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it seems to be pretty accurate because our heroes all jump off into the water, and uh, there's a nice shot there where the camera stays on the boat, and one of the crazy military guys gets killed, falls off the bridge into the boat, you know, and he's dead. So great little area there. The boat's destroyed. The boat's not working anymore. They go on on foot into the woods and they're still heading towards their rendezvous and a girl suddenly up ahead is screaming and she's being chased by humans that I suppose have been affected by the aliens. Mm. Uh, and they're not zombies. They're, they're just pretty much aggressive humans chasing after her, uh, but obviously in control by the aliens. Our heroes try to save her, but they don't get to her here in time and she's got her guts spilled out. Adam has a bit of a crisis of faith. And, you know, but the, the group rally and they keep him going. And really here then we do have, they find a little sanctuary in an old broken church and there's a bit of a downtime where they have they have some food, they have crumpets, they have a little bit of happy time. And unusually they, someone goes to the toilet. Yeah. That's yeah. not often in films do people actually go to the toilet no. unless they get attacked in the toilet and she doesn't. She, she doesn't. <laughs> um, and we also have that Kipper and Sam... Are developing a relationship. You know, they Sam sort of storms off, angry at Chloe, and Kipper goes after, her and they actually they, they're getting close, as close as they can oh, at the end of the world. I, that's that's one of my fave scenes in this actually. Yeah, and I'll tell you why in a bit. But yeah, keep okay, that in mind. <laughs> the tension, the tension. <gasps> Stay tuned. Stay tuned for later. Hit just after this commercial break. So a soldier then appears and arrests them. Uh, he's a bit of a he seems a bit crazy. This soldier as well. He's a yeah, bit yeah. aggressive, and he's, he's little a bit of a little little he's <laughs> hopper, hopper, hopper. Yep. Who again is a big YouTube dude. He's a he's actually a well trained clown apparently. Um, so and I thought that I thought he was a really good actor. He used his face really well. Oh, he um, was in Black Mirror. Yeah, season three. Yeah, there, there you yeah. go. So yeah, he's been around a little bit, obviously in some UK productions. Yeah. So the soldier arrests them, takes them to a base. It's all a bit sinister. But guess who's at the base? Adam's sister, Philippa. She survived. Their quest is over. They've they've found some, you know, substance here. They're happy. They're sad. They're take it in their experience. Adam is very emotional because of all the people he's had to kill on the road. Chloe and Sam um, actually then are a bit worried about the fact that she is an O blood type and because the soldiers tell them that O blood type actually is possible to slow down the bug attack, the yeah, alien attack. They weren't attack. sure if it stops they didn't it know, or kills it all. They weren't or too sure, yeah. And then that, so that explained going back to the doctor circling Manchester, 
she didn't want to go to Manchester for a holiday. She was actually circling, oh, it didn't really matter what where she put it. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> so, um, and then lo and behold, they are randomly attacked by this alien uh, spaceship and some of the soldiers get infected and they're attacking and unfortunately, Philippa is attacked. So Sam uh, reveals that she actually is the O blood type and gives the blood. And as Philippa is kind of changing losing herself to the alien it actually works she comes back yeah she, um, she comes back, which is good because uh, i would have been quite annoyed had they gone all that way <laughs> to try and find philippa they find her yeah and almost instantly she's turned and dead and you're like i just you know i don't mind a bit of brutality in my movies <laughs> but there are some things that i i just don't appreciate well this ain't no game of thrones you know you yeah. don't need to die in the next scene after we find you or even the walking dead quite often they the one character saves another because it's all about saving everyone and then they ca- they actually no, die. They cop a baseball back to the head. <clears throat> I.e. Carl. Anyway, so we keep moving and they say Filippo works, which is fantastic. And then there is that whole military. They question why was it Azkaban? What would, what did that mean? Yeah, Azkaban, 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 whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, you know, that sounds more real to me. I was trying to think, does this, I never Googled it, does this actually mean anything? Is it? Yes, you know, St. George's Lance. St. George's Lance, that's right. They do say that. They're slain yeah. of the dragons or something, I think. Is it about the dragons? But anyway, so yeah. they reveal with the captain that the whole thing is they have an alien weapon. The other soldiers, including Hopper, keep saying we should use this weapon. And the, the captain says, no, no, no. We've got to get it back to kind of the key military base. Um, so that, that's what they talk about. They say there's a rendezvous that they're heading to tomorrow with the helicopters. Um, and so they should sort of rest up and get ready for that. But then overnight, Hopper and his little clan that he's kind of pulled over soldiers, uh, you know, take Chloe yeah. and uh, kill, I suppose, the soldiers that were for the captain and the captain. Yeah. And so when the others wake up in the morning, they realise Chloe's gone the captain's, you know, he's tied up and he's cut. And, and again, we get just from these hard cuts hard to them cuts, waking up yep. alone and there's yeah. no, yeah, there's... We don't really know what's happened. You know, her camera's gone. left there on the ground, you know, et cetera. So they sort of think, well, they've probably gone to the rendezvous with the, the alien weapon. They head there, uh, they invade, they attack and they confront the soldiers and they're having a bit of a standoff and they're, they're arrested Taken to a, a prison. Oh, but Sam gets shot in the head, dude. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm jumping. Poor old yes, Kipper. Sorry. And There's Sam a moment there with Hopper, the isn't there? Yeah. Tell, tell me about that moment. Sorry. Actually, oh, it was a quite a tense moment because yeah. Hopper comes out and he's, he lines he's doing them all the typical um, lording his power over people, you know, and we've all seen people who would do this. I don't know whether they necessarily shoot anyone about it, but yeah, he's taking every opportunity to enjoy the fact that he now has some level of power and he gets to determine the fates. And so he, he first of all turns to Sam and sort of tells her to be quiet or something, you know, not much. And Kipper gets up and says, hey, what's, you know... Don't be, talk to my girl like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> you, you'd, be, you'd be cool. And a, a hopper face, you know, Seth gets up and Kipper's face and is just talking to him and then just almost... Uh, Accidentally or nonchalantly, shall we say? Yeah, that's better. Blast Sam's head with this big revolver, kaboom, yep. and she just falls over dead. Yeah. And that's terrible. And then they take him inside to lock him up. They do. They send and Ricky down. Ricky, go lock him up. See, to me, that is very realistic. I think that you know, so many films and shows, they you know, you've got your key characters, and they have that confrontation with a bad guy who has all the power over them, and you think, I, I always think, they would kill them. They would. Like, yeah. why would they keep them all? And, again, if it's a big spoiler for anyone out there, it does go back a couple of years ago, you know, with Negan in The Walking Dead. You know, like, you were thinking the whole time, surely he's not going to kill one of the one of the main characters. And, in fact, then he wipes out two of them. Yeah. You know, like... It, it tells the audience this is a real danger, you know, whereas mm. in so many other stories, it's like, I'm, I'm tough, I'm bad, I'm the Lord, I'll kill all these B characters that you don't know the names of, but all you main characters are going to kind of miraculously survive. So, again, I, I, I liked that. You know, I liked that 
he just brutally wiped out Sam, you know? I mean, she was Chloe's sister, main, real main character of the story. Yeah, relationship and forming with Kipper. Yeah, and relationship. And it just, you know, oh, you know, and I like, so I really like that, actually, to be honest. It made it real to me, mm. you know, uh, in this world. So that's, that's a, that was a good scene. Sorry, I did jump over that. <laughs> um, so anyway, they at the same time that they're getting arrested, the, the bugs, the aliens attack them and they're infecting the last soldiers and um, they manage to escape because that soldier does get infected right under, you know, right near them. And he gives them the keys at the last minute because they're sort of playing with him. And they instantly shoot him. They instantly shoot him because he's attacked in the head. So we'll put him out of his misery. Come on. You yeah. don't want to be an alien. Well, like shoot the alien. Yeah, shoot the alien. And the alien's just on the back of his head. Yeah. So, you know. Uh, so and and they know that the rest the the chopper is coming to get the alien weapon you know to meet up for this rendezvous kind of situation, and uh, they have the weapon. So they the they walkie talkie to the helicopters asking them, "Do you still have the weapon?" I guess you kind of think, well, if you said no, they probably wouldn't land. They just keep <laughs> no. going. I was going to say, um, you don't. And well, we're not yeah. risking ourselves. And so they're it? saying they have it, and they do have it. And then Adam realizes that. Well, look, why don't we use the weapon on the ship? It's the only way you're really going to get out of here anyway. Like, if we give you the weapon. There were two helicopters, weren't there? Like, the first one got hit. I I was a bit unclear whether there was two helicopters, and the first one actually got hit, or if it was just a near miss of the one helicopter. I think it was a near miss. But they they certainly introduced the idea that there is an alien ship there, and the helicopter is not safe, so long as the alien ships are around. Yeah, so the, the danger was, yeah, here's the alien weapon, but the alien ship's just going to annihilated isn't it you know they're yeah. not going to get anywhere with or without it so adam actually says take my sister and uh you know while she's run off to the helicopter he turns back you know and cohen realizes that that's the right decision and he goes one way they all go to the the helicopter <laughs> there's a great shot i reckon they hop on the helicopter and the the pilot goes have you got the what askaban yeah <laughs> is askaban safe, As- Azkaban safe? <laughs> and they're like yeah when guardian leviosa let's get the out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Can you see the ship? Go that way. Yeah. So they do, and they do. They take off, and, uh, you know, again, really nicely shot because we've just got that little video camera, and now we're on the helicopter and all the danger and Kabawi. Yeah, Adam the whole Adam, you know, again, in a big Hollywood film, it would be a nice close-up of everything, but we, we see it just from this wide shot inside the helicopter blurry yeah, you know Cowan from a distance sort of falls out a bit gets dragged back in he gets dragged out but he's okay they do another blood back. transfusion on Philippa yeah. so she sort of comes back and says thank you yeah thank you man I don't know how long that can go on for but <laughs> so well, that's if question. one zero uh, blood type has to give her a couple of pints every few hours it's not going to last very long is it no I, <laughs> that's how, what I was thinking that whole time how long was it that it wasn't very... Oh, well, it was overnight. It was a day, yeah, maybe wasn't a day. it? Let's call it 24 hours. And I suppose we don't exactly know how much she gave her. But, you know, if she gave her, like, a pint... I mean, when you donate blood, you can't. It, it's quite a bit of time between the next load, isn't it? And Chloe is only 16, remember, as well. She's only a kid, really. So she's so only got, like, three... Three pints liters? in a whole bottle. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think she can even donate blood uh, in our country, can she, at that age? I don't know. Well, that, well, that was the point. It was her birthday, 16th birthday. Maybe she could again. Oh, that's birthday. right. She could. She could. She could so. already donate. Legally, it was okay. So, yeah, the rest do escape on this chopper. The alien ship has been annihilated. And Chloe looks at the camera one last time and throws it out the chopper. Yeah. What's, which so is she's given of, up. She's given up on her mum. She's moved on, I think. Yeah, I think it's she's moved on to a different focus. I she had so. this focus of... Her mum will come back, and she's doing this video record for her mum, mm. and she chucks it. I think, yeah, she's going. There's something bigger for me to deal with. Yeah. Than missing my mum. I think so. Yes. Because uh, you know, Philip's brother just blew himself up. So. Mm. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't film it anymore. Yeah, it would be really cool though if she came close to <laughs> mum in the next movie. That. That might be the I next. There will be a movie. Another one. That, does he want This is the second, as we found out after watching the movie. Oh, well, yeah, again, we found out that this is kind of a sequel. I will say definitely it doesn't feel like a sequel. I think it's a standalone package. It absolutely you know? is. I have a feeling mm. that it was filmed that way on mm. purpose. Yeah, the yeah. story was presented uh, in the first one, Hungerford. Cohen is the hero, as I understand it. Right. Or the primary character, and it's his escape from Hungerford. Uh, and then in this one, of course, he's just come out of Hungerford, and he's... He's a primary character, but sort of Chloe, 
Chloe's the protagonist. Chloe's yeah. the, the main, yeah. the main deal. Yeah, definitely. This one. Yeah, right. Anyway, so that's the main plot points. So we talked about the viewing experience, so we can just jump on. So we go into... So to the best scene. I think you mentioned before, I suspect it's your best scene as well, the evacuation scene. Yep. That, I love the way that it, it jumped its way in there so quickly. It just, bang, we're evacuating. And it felt panicky. It didn't feel it did. staged. And I'd say the, the Hollywood gloss evacuations feel the stage yeah yeah you know they're effective and they do their job without a doubt yeah they and, do. and in the place of the those movies which are kind of a you know a, we have an omniscient viewpoint that mm. travels about the place and, and everything's tends to be large you know large and wide open this one here being uh, supposed to be a realistic portrayal of an individual it worked really well by jumping in and then she's like picking out and the dad's going, just, we, we have to get out of here. And everyone's kind of don't know what to grab and they, you know, they're just rushing out and they keep okay, running out and everyone else on the street is just running like same, yeah, mad panicking. people and there's all sorts of things going on. Yep. And it, it felt, it felt rush. I felt myself feeling tense. I it. did too, like, yeah. It was that sort of, just go, what are you doing? Run, 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 run. And it had that real feeling that going through there, um, I don't know if there was a musical score going there in, in the background. I don't, or not, yeah, but I don't think there majorly was. I'd, if there well, was, it, it was blended it worked, beautifully. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah. yeah it, and I, she tripped over yeah. and it actually took me a moment to realise what had happened. That's right. Because she's holding the camera, we can't see her. Yeah. The camera just suddenly goes low. Yeah. And the other people sort of stagger to a stop and run back. Yeah. And it took me just that, you know, one or two seconds to go, what, what's just happened? Oh, yeah. she's tripped. And then... And which was handy because it gave a still a moment of stillness for the camera yeah. to to take in the scenery as people yeah. were running past in the background and the plane yeah, came and over the yeah. and then yeah. crash that was beautiful it's, yeah it's and a, I, that scene as well started she's sort of a bit like staring at herself in the mirror and you know she's not you know she's she's down she's depressed and Sam kind of comes running in saying Dad says we have to go Dad says we have to go and then. Then we sort of like when she comes down the stairs and we, you know, we've come down with the camera, there's like, you know, a soldier pounding on the window. Like that's a nice effect, isn't it? You know, like it, it's not soldiers coming to your door. Oh, excuse me. It's time to leave. You yeah, know, like where, you know, not it's, an orderly there's, evacuation. There's no it orderly. A, it's like bang, bang, bang. You guys get out and just move, like run. Yeah. Like we don't know where you're running to, but just run. And, yeah. and that, and then that's what they confront. Because the, the soldiers street. didn't stop to direct them no, or to no. help them. It's just. No, the best they could come up yeah. with, yeah, uh, was was to and, bang on the windows until people would get moving. Yeah, and I think you know it's probably an interesting thing when you look at London and the history of London going back to like World War Two, how they were bombed by the Nazis and they, you know, they, they set up people in the street, the wardens, and they had evacuations and people built uh, shelters in their backyard, bomb shelters with their neighbours, and they rationed yeah. food. And this is sort of almost. The opposite of that. It's it's just like you just got to get the hell out of here right now. You know the immediacy of it. Yeah, you know? the, the speed was clearly too yeah. great. The, yeah, because World War Two built over years. It did. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. The, they the, knew they were coming. Yeah, by the time that uh, Hitler was actually sending airplane bombers over, the the year the war had been going for a bit, and mm. there was there was already understood that that was what's going. That's good. That's about yeah. Well, they'd def- they'd um, retreated from France, hadn't they? Where in this the case, Allies, the, so. the aliens. They, just appeared. They had no clue what their motive is, what their agenda is, and they they just even what their attack strategy was. Yeah. It seemed relatively random because they couldn't, uh, they weren't holding a front against the aliens, no. and then telling people behind the front, okay, you got to start moving out. It was just suddenly there's an alien ship there shooting people, and yeah, you got to get out of there. So it was a very effective scene. Good confusion, yeah. A good sense of urgency. That's I really right. felt that they they had to move because we didn't know at that stage, and we still don't really know by the movie. But we didn't really know at that stage what the capabilities of these aliens no, were. We had no. no clue whether they were doing carpet bombing or uh, had ground forces invading. Yeah, yeah. Or what they were doing. Yep. There's no way of knowing whether maybe in hindsight maybe they could have actually just stayed in their house. Yeah. You know, maybe just sort of maybe hidden in a cupboard or something and waited until the alien went past and did their bit. 
but maybe not. Yeah, you just don't know, do you? And, I mean, it's one of those things, I think, in any of these sort of evacuation, you know, zombies are the same. You know, like, do you stay or do you go? <laughs> like, mm. if you stay in the city and lots of people get infected, then you're kind of locked in the city with them and that can pose danger. We don't know what the aliens were capable of that stage, you know, and they would, we see with the father they drop down, obviously the soldier shoots him in the head dead. It's like, well, yeah, if you stay, you're in trouble. If you go, you're in trouble, aren't you? And it's that, I, that I chaos think, is there. I think there. the line is if you go, there'll be trouble. If you stay, there will be double. <laughs> yeah. That's the, the You know that better lines. than I do. Another um, moment, it's not so much a huge scene, but when they do, we mentioned it before, come out and of the tunnels and they see the destroyed London with the destroyed the, the bus, the double-decker bus, the double bus, yeah. bus, just signifying that it is London. There's a moment there that uh, Chloe then sort of, she sets up the camera and, and she smiles like it's a uh, selfie. Yeah, they do and, like a, a and group photo. The others kind of like Cohen and that kind of look and then they join in. And as they're doing that, then a building collapses yeah. behind them, which was already kind of, you know, half destroyed, missing a bit of a floor or something. But it literally, you know, implodes uh, on itself. And I, I just, it was kind of a really funny moment, you know. And I, I found it funny because I think, again, you know, I mean, I'm a little bit older, but this generation probably would take a photo, you know, like she's filming it. I know she's filming it, but that, yeah, like I know in this Armageddon world, I think, I think people would still take photos. Group, group uh, selfie. Group selfie, group photo, there's yeah. a moment. And, I mean, look, as a writer, it's it's a moment of kind of like we've had tension, 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 screwdriver, tighten, tighten, tighten. We just need a little bit of yeah, a they, ha-ha They moment. got out of the tunnels, tunnels which was claustrophobic you know, and dark and scary. Yeah, and so we're all a bit, you know, I was tense during those tunnel mm. scenes because you just, you know, when there's those tunnel scenes, they're through water. and all, I mean, God knows what they're bloody going to come across. So I've seen enough horror films. You never know. Yeah. And, um, you know, nothing is there, but you're sitting there the whole time biting your fingernails. Well, it's interesting you you, you're talking about <laughs> these sort of selfies and, and so on. And when I was 16, so, you know, back in the 1800s, <laughs> we didn't have uh, easy access to cameras. No, we did not. Cameras were obviously plenty of cameras around and my brother had a camera. Yeah. But it was a, you had 24 shots on the roll of film, maybe, or 36, depending on what you size. You sure did. Ooh, we got 36. 24. <laughs> we got 24 because, you know, we're not professionals. And <laughs> you didn't know what they looked like because you, you looked through a manual viewfinder, yep. took the photo, and it wasn't till days later, weeks later, whenever you, you sent your film to be developed. Once you'd taken those 24 photos, sorry, wasn't yep. it? You know, which might take 12 months. So there was no casual, no. oh, let's do a quick selfie, let's take a shot of this. Whereas now with the cameras uh, and on phones, everyone's got cameras everywhere. Mm. Uh, I was riding with the kids the other day and we sort of paused. There were some black swans and uh, there, was, there was nice sort of, we were in a little area we hadn't been in, like a little, um, what do you call it, a marina type of thing. There's some black swans there and the kids were like, oh, black swans. And so they stopped riding their bikes and went over to it. And so I took a couple of photos because, not because it made a particularly great photo. I think you're not going to win any art prizes, but it doesn't cost me anything. Yeah, that's right. I was going to be standing there anyway. Yeah. And my wife wasn't with us, so I thought, oh, she'd love to see what the kids are up to and what's going on. So a couple of photos. And that's what we do. We take and, hundreds of photos of that. But and I'm, I'm terrible at taking f- f- photos. So you're talking about someone who's 16 today, yeah. grown up with internet and grown up never knowing, not having a camera at, at, with effectively unlimited footage available mm-hmm. on it at all times. Uh, yeah, you just you take photos because you, you don't know. Um, and... I would have taken more photos when I was oh, a yeah, kid. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Yeah. Uh, there was heaps of places I would have taken photos of little videos and things, but yeah. we just didn't have that. No. You know, let's not even talk about the video cameras of the day. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was quite, quite a, a generational moment. It, it really so, did yeah. point out this is current. Mm. It's not, you know, uh, in, the, in the olden days. And uh, I've watched in the olden days, it's like you know, 10 years ago. <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was watching, I was listening to a, an audio drama podcast called We're Alive. Right. Uh, it's a sort of a, a zombie apocalyptic world setting and its quality is very much like a movie, but without the video. You can't see it, but it's all the sound effects, everything, it's all really engaging. And for a while I was listening to it thinking, there's something wrong, something's not sitting right with me, there's situations here which aren't making quite the right sense 
And when I look back, I found it was made in 2009. So that's when it was released. So it would have been made 2007, 2008, a good 10 years ago. And I thought back then, like, iPhones, iPhones were only just brand new. Facebook was in its infancy. Instagram, I don't think Instagram existed in 2006, 2007. I'm pretty sure it didn't. Podcasts had only just been around for a short period. So yeah, yeah. iPhones had been there for, for a year or so. So it was, it was getting me that they weren't communicating easily. They weren't checking cell phones. They, they didn't, you know, the internet was something not mentioned or thought of. And it was like, uh, that's what was missing. Whereas this movie here, and, and there's a number of other movies where they, you wonder, why don't you just phone them? Yeah. Like, you're not really isolated. And, yeah. But more modern films, and this one in particular, have to come up with ways of disabling these phones because mm. how many horror movies or thrillers would be totally foiled <laughs> if the person just, like, films the monster coming up to them. When they run back to their house and say, hey, there's a monster out there, click, look, and people go, well, oh, that is, that's... That's horrifying. That's, yeah, okay, we're going to believe you at least yeah. enough that... We should get out of here. We or, should do something. Whereas yeah. in the past, it was, there was a monster, you're a drunk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, How I many drinks have you had tonight? Sorry, yeah. 18? Oh, we're not going to believe what you saw out there. I've been drunk before and I've never <laughs> once seen a monster. But nonetheless, the uh, yeah, that, that selfie moment quite... I just thought that was a nice fitting. moment overall. That and the chaos were probably my favourite uh, moments. Any any bad scenes? Oh, or no, worst scenes? I was going to tell you another good the scene. scene about the uh, Kipper and Sam. Oh, yeah, you did say when, So that. Sam's all upset because Chloe, her little sister, just murdered a dude. Yep. Uh, murder's a harsh term. Yeah. Killed in self-defence. I mean, she did go pretty apeshit on that guy. And, and, and that would be quite disturbing for an older sister. I think so, yeah. I reckon if I saw my little brother do that, yeah. you know, yeah, me as too. a teenager, I'd be like, a oh, holy mother of yeah, God! She, what's, I mean, like Sam's young too. You know, I mean, this is it's the thing. Like, it's scary weird. stuff. Yeah, and yeah. It's very confronting. And so she's kind of freaking out about that. And Kipper comes up and says, um, he, he, "He says the right things." You know, he. he and I was quite surprised that the, the, the wording of it was made it about her that she was being good and and she was really looking after Chloe. None of this sort of you're being silly. You shouldn't take. No, yeah. he was actually doing saying the right things. And the thing I really liked about that scene, I don't know if it was in purpose or not, and I'd love to ask, uh, like, Drew and the guy who plays Jesse. Kipper. Jesse, yeah, yeah. Who plays Kipper? Is it? Oh, no, no, that's not. That Jesse's the other writer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, was it? Oh, see, now I'm clicking away. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Sam Carter. Sam Carter, the good old Sam Carter. Yeah, yeah, I love Sam Carter and all of... Well, actually, I haven't seen Huma- Hungerford. I'd love no. to, but he's in that too. Yeah. So he's he reaches for her hand. Like, he sort of steps forward, and the whole thing... It gives me flashbacks to uh, many years ago prior to being married. And he, he sort of sits forward and says this sort of nice thing that reassures her and reaches for her hand and kind of... <laughs> Awkwardly There's reaches. this awkward not quite finding the hand and then holding it and the whole scene, it, I, said, I don't know if that was intentional or if that was just kind of... The magical uh, moment. The, the, the moment in, in the acting where they, they just didn't quite find hands and they were supposed to be a bit more smooth about it, but it spoke to me of things that scenes I've seen, yeah. like as an observer and also experienced, where it's never like in the in the dramas. Mm. You know, yeah, where they, that's right. They, they lack lyrical, lyrical with these yeah. amazing monologues about yeah. things and then they do a kiss or an embrace or they do some sort of gesture which is perfect. And this is kind of like he says the right thing in sort of an odd way and then moves forward and awkwardly doesn't quite get a hand and holds it and sort of, am I doing this right? Yeah. Sort of moment. And, and it, it was just really, there, there was, a, I think you're right. Like there was really a closeness, genuine. a genuine closeness happening between the two of them, but it wasn't the Hollywood because the Hollywood, they would have kissed, you know? And, oh yeah. I was expecting it, it, I was, and I was crazy. That's the thing. You're was, like, but, but in fact, in, again, in reality, if you took this is this is like real and alien, I mean, you wouldn't kiss. You would be panicking for your life. You know, they just earlier they had mm. that alien scenario with the lasers and the mouse and stuff. So, like, I don't know. It, I think I think it. You know, Hollywood quite often plays off that idea. Oh, you're in this scary tension moment. You're going to make out and have sex. But I think quite often this is a this idea is a bit more relative. Like, yeah, sure, these two are forming a bit of a bond, a bit of a stronger relationship. They're liking each other, mm. um, but they're still got to. 
it's not like you're just going to lash onto each other with tongues, are you? Like as soon as there's a moment alone in the yeah, dark, I've, like it, it bothers it, me a lot in you know, those uh, thrillers. And she, or and she was angry yeah. at her sister. Like she's not going to just go from being angry to going all over him and tonguing him. <laughs> like there's got to be a little bit of realism, and it felt real to me that scene. I agree. So, and he actually sort of I can't remember the line, but he was genuinely kind of quite nice about his, you know, what he delivered to her. And, and he took that step forward and he kind of reaches. And she's the same. You know, she's a bit awkward as well. They're both a bit awkward about it. And it did feel real. Yeah. Yeah, I did, it had I did it. Like And that's that. how I quite like that it yeah. it, it moved me. And uh, and as a general, the final thing about liking is general, there's a, a number of very, along with these hard jump cuts, there's some very brutal uh, action so Sam getting shot in the head that yeah. was just like delivered out of nowhere yeah, was he's off scene. the side he just yeah. sort of reached his hand out and goes bang and blasts her brains out yep. and there was a couple of other bits there where oh, when Adam walks in on Brian who's taking the glasses off Kipper and yeah. and Adam just sort of shoots these people he shoots them down yeah which, yeah. which no doubt comes from his skills with uh and even VR Ricky, games and yeah, and even Ricky, you know, like he's the soldier. He puts him in the prison. They're pleading with him, like the aliens are above. You know, just give us a chance, give us a chance. And he goes, uh, and he does. He gives them the keys. The bug grabs his head. They shoot him in the head. Yeah, you know, like bland. instantly. You know, and the whole time, even earlier, even though he went off with Hopper, you, you felt like his moral compass was a bit like, oh, I'm just trying to survive here. You know, yeah. and I'm not too sure what the right answer is. So yeah, there, there was that good debate. Yeah. Suppose for I didn't really have like a worse scene stand out, but if I go back very early with Bob, with Angry Bob, yeah, yeah. I, I felt that yeah, it was implied that maybe him and Sam, uh, you know, maybe Sam was sexually satisfying or something. And again, the film didn't need to go into details or anything. And and again, it wouldn't really make sense her sister filming it. Yeah, I know. You know like so again, you sort of think, well, the she, whole yeah, film is says, and Sam calms him down calms him down you know like and that's fine like we we get the impression that and i think there's a shot where she's kind of like sitting going oh my sister's okay my sister's okay so you know other films we might see a bit of the nastiness going on but um and, and, and i don't necessarily think we needed to see that but he was angry but it i don't know it need, to me it just felt like he should have been nastier because yeah, either it, he should have been totally cracked yeah like it, in which case, it's kind of it almost doesn't matter why or anything like. No, he's just he's just a loony. He's just he's just gone loony, and f- for whatever reason, and we kind of get a bit of an insight there where he says, "You're not taking my girls off me." Yeah, yeah. So you got an idea that is he actually just kind of like Holding a possessive narcissist? It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or did he have daughters of his own that he's lost? And that he's, he's lost, and you know, he's sort of substituting with these it girls. Sounds, yeah. It feels like there could have been. Yeah, a little bit of background there. Maybe it got cut. Yeah, because it, it didn't serve the story very well. But but it, yeah, it because I, I, I suppose insight there why he was upset that Chloe was had the candles had like the yeah. little shrine to her parents. Yeah, and he's kind of like, oh, what are you doing? Don't do that, you fucking bitch. That's <laughs> not right. And you kind of go, whoa. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it, I wouldn't be surprised to find that in fact he's like, yeah, don't. Mourn them. You don't get that right because I'm not allowed to. Yeah, we got to survive. Girls. We have to survive. But that, that connection not quite there, and he wasn't quite loony, nasty no. enough to get away from not having that's right a connection. There. And and that's what I mean. Maybe you know we didn't see him and Sam Sam do anything to you know help him or whatever. Maybe that needed. Maybe we did need to see. I don't know. Like they do, to me, it just felt like when he did die, I was a bit like oh, mm, yeah. like I wasn't. I wasn't quite yeah, sold on that. Yeah, he sort of go, uh, well, it's for the best. Yeah, yeah. And I think I yeah. think he needed to be either, I think you make a good point, either totally totally loony or uh, he was like mourning the death and so he's really nasty or really protective. Mm. Like maybe there should have been a couple of shots where he was really protective. Overly protective. <clears throat> of the girls with the with Kipper and Cohen and so that, and then all of a sudden attacked him. The scene with Brian, for example, on the other hand. Yeah. We didn't need to know what Brian's story was. No. Because... Uh, or Hopper even because they were nasty enough. They were That's right. loony enough that you kind of loony. Went, I don't care what his justification yeah. <laughs> is. <laughs> he's a loony. He's doing. He's gone too far. He know? has straight Whereas away. Bob got the feeling he was trying to do something good, but he was not. Didn't know how. Mm. But then you sort of go, well, why? Why did he yeah. have to die? Like, I don't know why was then he killing them. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I got a little bit miffed over that bit. Yeah. I wonder though if it was actually because uh, Stuart Ashen, the guy who played Bob 
kind of being an online personality didn't want to be shown too be, badly. Too, maybe none <laughs> of these characters wanted to be shown, shown certain ways yeah, yeah, because yeah. they do have an online an audience. Online, but, and as, as much credit as I like to give humans and myself, sometimes it's hard for people to distinguish a character that's been written, that someone's acting, and their real selves. So maybe, maybe, well, maybe well, there's some sensitivities yeah. there. That I mean, I mean, even though they're YouTubers, they are still presenting a version of themselves. Yeah. You know, shock horror out there if you're listening to this podcast. If I've just smashed the illusion of the mirror of YouTube, but it is still a version, even when people are holding up a camera to themselves. Hate yeah, to break it. Too. So in reality, <laughs> in reality. I don't like science fiction at all. I'm, I'm a, <laughs> yeah. no. That's right. That's right. Exactly Get right. Just, so did you have like a scene that maybe stood out or any sort of the one complaint? We do like to be very joyful over the, these podcasts, but anything that you sort of think maybe was a bit of a hole or anything you want to pick uh, okay, up? Okay. So or is it good? All good. The, oh, you're finally old enough to go give blood because, oh, I've got a rare blood type. And I'm like, when I was watching that sort of going, I've just been punched in the face with a story element here. I can, I don't know how this is going to come into it, but yeah. I've just been hit with the fact that she has a. We haven't been told what this rare blood type is either. Just she's got a rare one. I don't know how else to have uh, incorporated that without mm. having a a much longer scene because yeah. it's quite a short scene. Yeah. Uh, so I was introduced very quickly. You know, I'm, I'm not going to see him and offer insights on how to have made that a better scene yeah. given the movie yeah. context, but. That one there, but when that happened, I was, yeah, I was like, okay, there's, I just, you know, someone's just poking the we've, eye with a blood yeah, type. we've given you a big bunch of information here. Yeah. Andy, look, if you're out there listening, you know, and you had some best scenes or favourite scenes, it'd be lovely to hear them on our Instagram and Twitter accounts. Uh, or worst scenes, yeah, hit us up. Let us know what you think. Do you agree with us? Do you disagree with us? You know, it'd be great to, to hear your feedback. So sorry, the exciting time. I know you love guns and really all that sort of thing. Is well, this, I'm not is this the science in this show that you no. want to pick on or is it, a, is it the alien invasion or what science did you pick out of this particular film? It was very interesting because at first I was thinking about uh, anti-gravity mm-hmm. because these ships are sort of floating and in fact there's a scene when they're uh, evacuating yeah. And there's stuff floating up into the mm. sky a little bit, like there's a car and a few bits of there odds is, and ends. There is, isn't there? And so I was thinking about anti-gravity because there's been some interesting uh, developments in terms of anti-gravity. We have, the, uh, we have a quantum definition of gravity uh, and we have like this idea of a, a cla- what would you call it, a, a classical view. Maybe that's not the right term. Anyway, where maybe you have, so you, either gravity is a side effect of mass on space-time, an emergent effect, which is unusual. Physics doesn't like that. Physics likes to sort of say we have a measurable force or a measurable acceleration, and if we have a measurable acceleration, then there must be some carrier of that force, something transmitting that force, and it must travel at most at the speed of light. Right. They have done measurements of gravity. Recently, we've had uh, we've, here in Australia, in fact, WA up near Jinjin, they've got a, a gravity meter. So they've got this great big long tube with a, a known mass at one end and a laser pointing that's you know, got a super fine uh, detection Sweet. device on it. And they've got a laser going this way. So if a gravity wave, so if gravity travels in waves and is transmitted by uh, photons or you know, similar particle, mm then it's going to, a wave hitting will move these two balls slightly differently at different times. And the lasers will pick up this slight movement and the time difference between the two movements will tell us how fast gravity travels. Yeah, right. And we have actually measured the speed of gravity. At the moment, it appears to be limited by the speed of light. So uh, there was thoughts that gravity... So this, this is odd because if gravity is a, just a distortion of space-time caused by mass, then as mass moves, then space-time should be more or less instantly modified. But that's gravity, and I don't want to talk about gravity. I want, oh. to, talk about, I want to talk about blood types. <laughs> blood I realize, types, right. I can start talking about gravity a lot there. Yeah, yeah, don't go too much into gravity. There, there will be other science fiction well, movies. Well, look, as well, I don't know if this film got too much into gravity either. 
No, no. I know but, I'm not the science dude, but still. Blood come types. On. Which, Stretching it. So we're talking about blood types. <laughs> blood types, yeah. Can very, blood types stop aliens? Yes. Oh, we have sold. scientific evidence that, in fact, blood types can stop aliens. Wow. Okay. So Beyond the darker storm? Yeah. And, and I'll, <laughs> I'll go through my steps, which lead me to this statement, okay. this bold statement. So we have, Step it through. as we all know, Karl Lundsteiner. Oh, He's yeah. an Austrian biologist and physician. In 1900, he uh, worked to um, categorise the B, the blood type, so the A, B, O blood typing system. And then he worked with uh, Alexander S. Wiener for discovering the rhesus factor. So that means the A, B, A, B, or O blood type. And as we know, Chloe was O. Yep. And then the rhesus factor, which is the antigen D, which is either positive or negative. Okay. So on the outside of your red blood cell, you've got a number of proteins and sugars. Uh, in fact, in total, there's about 36 blood type variations possible, but we don't look at most of those. Primarily when we're talking about blood transfusions, which is what happened in this movie, yeah. we're talking about the ABO and rhesus. So that's, I'm A positive, so that means I have the A antigens. That means I've got a bunch of proteins and sugars on the outside of my blood cells, which we classify as A, and positive meaning I have this D antigen sitting, which is like another sort of protein cluster on my blood cell. Yep. And uh, it's not entirely clear what the purpose of these is because people who have A positive live in exactly the same way as people who have A negative. Yeah. And B positive, B negative, uh, so they've got the B on the outside and the, and the D yes or no. O O means they have neither A nor B. And if you're O negative, which is what Chloe was, means you don't have the rhesus on it. You, you've, you're the universal donor because yeah. you've got nothing on the outside that will be identified by an immune system and attacked. So, she, she's, so she's got the universal type. So maybe, like I said before, is there more light? Is there more O? Oh, there's only about 9% of the population is O negative. Oh, right. No, so it is the other way around. So she's I was quite, just going to say, is there more of them then? No, nah, so it's the other way around. Right. Yeah. No, and so, so we are a bit screwed the, with these aliens. The idea, though, that, <laughs> well, it's convenient. And I, I reckon old um, who made this film? <laughs> Drew. Drew. Drew I was going to call him Cullen. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Well, well Cullen. Yeah, go with Cullen. So, <laughs> but the, the, the clever thing that Drew did, of course, is O negative, you can just trans... And I, and I say can because there'll be a hematologist out there who'll say, no, there are no, 36 no. different classifications. You can have a J and a K and a JA and a JB. And a, well, if one of them is listening and they want to tag us in this debate, go us. for it. But by and, <laughs> large, by and large, most of those other classifications are not very relevant as far as our immune system is concerned. Okay. There's only a couple of key bits there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The most important one is the ABO and, yes. and, yeah, and yeah. RH. So the O negative, of course, has none of the A, none of the B, none of the D uh, antigens on it, which means that there's, it doesn't have the sorts of things that our immune system cares about. So Chloe could, in fact, just transfuse to anyone. To everyone, yeah. So really handy. Yep. But now you're going, okay, so that's cool. So we've overcome one concern is that you can't just transfuse. Like I'm A positive and my wife is A negative, which means that when we had kids, she had to have the anti-D vaccination okay. after having I because I is a positive like me and that meant then that Pip being a negative she could have an allergic reaction to Ivy's blood right. which meant then if Elliot when he came along turned out to be a positive as well he would be rejected right uh, so as it turns out he's a negative so not a problem but we still have to have the special injection to make sure yeah Chloe doesn't have that problem she's got an O she can give her blood to anyone and in theory, we should be able to tolerate it. Yeah. So that so that's one bit. So you can she could just give her blood, but how could it possibly stop a parasite? Yeah, that's my question to you, Andrew. Well, here's the interesting thing. <laughs> Did you know that people with O and particularly O negative blood are asymptomatic of malaria? Okay. They don't die from malaria. Wow! Wow! Uh, wow! 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 I'm sure there are some that must die yeah. from malaria, but. Again, by and large, if you've got O-type blood, You're you are resistant more, to malaria. Yeah. You wow. can get the malaria. Malaria is a little uh, single-cell organism, plasmoid. Is that what they're called? Sounds good to me. Keep <sighs> running. Anyway, yeah, like, so like a little amoebary type thing, <laughs> yeah. which lives inside a mosquito. Uh, when it's ready, 
when it's not ready, it tells the mosquito to go eat honey. Mm -hmm. And so the mosquito goes around and eats more nectar. When it is ready, it tells the mosquito, okay, now you want to drink blood. Yeah. So a bit of mind control there. This is tying there. So the malaria gets into a human. And one of the ways, and it causes, because it's unrecognized, we have an immune response. We have fevers, um, you know, headaches, normal sort of uh, immune response type of activity there. But what it also does is it cause, uh, causes clotting and blood thickening which is not usually is not enough to cause like strokes or any of that sort of thing, but it kills our kidneys mm -hmm. and liver and we and we die. O type blood cells do not clot as well. They clot well enough, but malaria can't make them clot up to the point where they kill people. So type O, in fact, can you know, walk around with this malaria bug in them with no symptoms. So they don't keel over, they don't do uh, anything. Which of course is interesting because it means then that mosquitoes can feed off them and get infected and infect poor old people like me. A positive, in fact, more often than not go into a coma and die with mm -hmm. malaria. Yeah. So I'm not I'm I'm now a little bit more cautious about the whole malaria. <laughs> the mosquito thing. I'll be drinking my tonic water, thank you very much. <laughs> so jump G and T for me. Okay, That's so, right. so here, here we have some evidence here that shows that there's well there's a little plasmoids can actually be you know, negated by type yeah. O negative blood. And I mean, the aliens in this film are bugs. They are bugs. You know, so. And I've got to assume that they're genetically engineered. Yeah. Uh, I suspect, you know, I would suspect they're not genetically engineered perfectly for humans to control them, mm. but they're genetically engineered well enough that they go into a host and they infect the central nervous system, cause inflammation, immune response causes brain fevers, basically. Yeah send someone a bit crazy. So you've got something like rabies, for example, which is a virus, but it attacks the central nervous system and it causes extreme aggression, causes um, hydrophobia, so fear of water. You don't want to drink water and then death. But an, um, a relative, a close relative of malaria is the, the toxoplasmosis, which is from cats. So it's, it's a little, again, a little single cell uh, amoeba, a I'm just going to call them plasmoids. And it, it spends part of its life cycle inside a cat where it lays eggs. The eggs come out in cat poo. The, um, you know, say mice or people cleaning up cat poo get some of these eggs on and become infected. They grow a little bit, but they can't reproduce inside of a, a non-cat host. So mice and rats, for example, they lose their fear of cats and they actually become attracted to urine cat pee. Mm. So these infected mice are more likely, they also lose their um, agoraphobia. So rats and mice don't like open spaces. Yeah, they, yeah, they stick in little narrow places. Corners, yeah. Infected with uh, the toxoplasmosis, they will willingly walk across open spaces and if they smell cat weed, they're actually attracted to it. Right. So uh, cat's marking its territory, mice come in and they're not afraid. Yeah. Cat eats them. Cat eats them. Becomes infected with the these parasite which breeds inside the cat gut and lays its eggs right. so the cycle is incredible isn't it and there is some good reason to believe so there's we're talking about malaria which uh infects about 200 million people a year 600,000 of whom primarily children under five die so i'm not going to sub-saharan africa because that's where it happens a lot <laughs> yes it does it's not because uh interesting so so toxo when it infects humans there is research which shows a correlation. So the scientists published this study where they studied 80,000 Danish blood donors and they found that uh, schizophrenia diagnosis about 151 people and then they had a look at people who were exposed to the toxo um, gondii bug which yep. is what uh, does toxoplasmosis. 47% increased odds of being diagnosed with schizophrenia. Right. And they found that of the people who were diagnosed with the uh, toxo before and then diagnosed with schizophrenia after, they were two and a half times more likely to develop the disease post-exposure. Mm. So it's not proof, but there's good reason to believe that this toxo actually will mess your brain up. Toxo is closely related to malaria. Malaria is stopped by typo negative. It's quite possible these aliens have engineered a little, uh, you know, single-celled, uh, amoeba mm. to infect us not necessarily to control us but certainly make us go crazy by yeah. causing inflammation of the, the brain for example which would 
maybe cause our own immune system to knock out our, our inhibitions yes. and so forth. And if it's transported by connecting to blood cells, maybe type O negative it can't can't transport, mm. and so it can't get into the blood into the brain. Uh, Very and valid. It, then the kidneys get a chance to flush it. So maybe after a few transfusions, you or, might be a, okay. or enough of a big enough transfusion, maybe Philip will be okay. Yeah, because she she does say she feels it kind of coming back a bit. Remember, yeah. and, then, and then it's sort of. At the helicopter, she gets another. They start doing it again. So, but you might be right. After a couple, she could be good. Yeah, it's funny about because just when you were talking here, my when I watched the film, I was kind of thinking the bugs were the aliens. And now that you've just said all that, I'm like, oh no, the the bugs could be a weapon. Yeah, the bugs. Yeah, just, you know, I they thought were, they were just a weapon. Yeah, yeah. But, and so, but I don't know. You don't, you're not really told. And it'd be great if Drew could answer that question. I reckon. So if he does end up listening to that, that would be a good question. I also hope Are the he bugs knows. I the aliens? Or I hope he hasn't just kind of written this story going... It'd be cool with bugs coming down. We I reckon he really knows. I reckon he knows. I'm putting a lot of faith in him and Jesse. One of them could answer that question, I reckon. Put a lot of work into this. Yeah, know. yeah. So that's a question we need to reach out to them with, I reckon. But then, yeah, because it makes a lot of sense for them to actually be like a biological weapon. You're exactly right. I, but I just didn't think of it like that. <laughs> I was just thinking bugs, you know, because so many of these films, aliens are bugs, you know. Mm. Uh, you know, District 9, Independence Day, they're these big sort of bugs, you know. Uh, but, yeah, the bug could just be a pure weapon. And, I mean, really the film suggests that they wanted to just annihilate the human race. And so, so you could look at it like biological weapon. They transport a bug, you know, they just drop these bugs from their spaceship that yeah. attack onto the human brain and then you get infected and you're, you're not a zombie, but you're, all you're interested in doing is like killing and infecting other humans. So you're wiping out anything else that lives and you're probably decaying, dying because you're not yeah, going to eat and drink you'd, and you'd stuff. imagine that if There's you've also, got an, a, a, something stepping with your brain, yep. you're, yeah, you're not going to last long. It's implied that you, you, you're basically dead. And then also with that weapon, you know, we mentioned earlier you know, on the bridge, they kill it. But there's that moment in the church where the, you know, they go, the mouse and the green weapon laser comes over. It's and I like thought this would get you it, really too. excited, like scans it and it just vaporizes the mouse. You know, like, so it's not uh, scanning and deciding, oh, that's a human, that's a mouse, I won't kill the mouse. It's just obviously scanning. This thing is alive. It's not a tree. It's, you know, biologically breathing maybe. Maybe that's what the scanner is. Boom. Well, <laughs> You're done. Yeah, I was wondering about that myself like, and I thought the closest I could think of would be a neutron beam, like a neutron yeah, laser. Yeah, yeah. So, well, it would be a laser because lasers have to be photons. But the neutron weaponry, uh, as it's been, and it happens when you have a, a hydrogen explosion, like a bomb, fusion bomb explosion, when neutrons hit, because neutrons are really big fat things. They sit inside the middle of a, an atom. Electrons are you know, tiny in comparison. Like as far as the neutron is concerned, the electron is like an atom to it. You know, it's tiny. Mm. And the neutron is this great huge thing. So neutrons go flying about the place. And when they hit humans, they're big enough and heavy enough to actually punch holes mm. in you and in your cells and destroy, you know, smash your DNA and things. So if you got hit by a concentrated neutron beam, you would splash apart. Like yeah. Your body would disintegrate. Slash up. But not disintegrate in, like, being burnt up. You would splash to the floor in a pile of goo <laughs> because all of your cell membranes would, would rupture and you'd be terrible. But it has very little effect on solid things. Like, yeah, right. uh, like On a, things that are just wall or molecular... Uh, atoms joined together it yeah. could make them a little bit radioactive for a little while because and if you had like if you fire a neutron beam into a nuclear reactor you could cause it to melt down and things but but you know mostly for the most part if you're going to shoot a brick wall with a, a, a neutron beam you it wouldn't explode nothing would happen right okay. but if a person was standing behind the brick wall and you shot the person would melt would sp splatter yeah, well, it seemed that the laser was a bit, I don't know, because they were hiding, I guess, from the mm. laser, you know, but it did get that. And then I think it is War of the Worlds that does that as well, doesn't it? There's like laser. Is there a laser in the yeah, Steven got, Spielberg one? Yeah, they a green light. And... Yeah, that hunts for it. So this film, I suppose, plays off that a little bit. But mm. I guess it then made me, you know, everything you've just talked about. And it, but I thought this when I watched it as well. It's like, 
well, these aliens don't, they want, I think they wanted just to annihilate every human and, yeah. and possibly every living thing. I don't know. I'm not too sure. Like, they didn't want to destroy the planet. So, I suppose you're presuming that they want to take it over, but they just, every human should die, should die which is always interesting. I like, you know, I like that idea. I like that idea of a premise of an alien coming here and not assimilating. And it's the opposite of the beyond, isn't it? The beyond, we have a uh, advanced race that kind of decides, oh, you guys are worth keeping. Yeah, we'll you know, see what you get to. We'll see what you get up to. So, whereas in this film, we're saying that, well, this alien, very Independence Day kind of idea, it's coming here just to literally annihilate the planet. Well, not annihilate the planet, sorry, annihilate humans on the planet. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is probably quite reasonable, really. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We're just sort of, if, when you're looking at uh, sort of a Machiavellian worldview, you come across a planet with an intelligent species that can uh, actually use technology to yep. uh, you know, get to space and things. They're, yeah, they're only going to be a threat. You can, ve- you can easily look at it and say, they're just going to be a threat. Yep. Let's like, just wipe them out. We want to live here and we will just be fighting them all the time. Mm. They fight each other as it is just because one wears a, a round hat and some wears a pointy hat. Mm, yeah. Let's fight. You know? Well, I mean, but so, even as humans, we, I mean, we, we've done the same thing to each other, haven't we? Well, like, we've, exactly. we've gone to and lands it, and wipe it out, wipe out the humans out of that land because I want to take it over. I mean, you know, yeah, I, mean, I mentioned na- Nazis and Hitler before. I mean, it's the same idea. It's like conquer you know and i guess that i mean that's the other thing whether they actually want to annihilate every single human or not who knows they might just show show the force that they have and go well surrender or we'll do the same thing maybe they figure if they drop the population down to about 10 percent, yeah then it's okay then they'll be manageable yes i don't again i I like the fact that none of that's explained because yeah yeah they're aliens they've got alien agenda we don't we don't know how they think they we think of in terms of thoughts and emotions Mm. but the, our, what we call emotions are just chemical reactions in our brain which result in physical sensations which our thoughts then associate with our context. And an alien has got an entirely different physiology, different mindset and different set of emotions. They, they really may not get angry or jealous in the way we do. No, that's right. They may have a, a, a slightly different response which is simply, you know, kill that thing that is a bit awkward. You know, like some sort of... Yeah, and, and, and you also think as well, I always think in films like this, you know, like the spaceship that comes here to annihilate us is, is most likely their soldiers. You know, and you mm. think about our soldiers, you know, they do a great job, but they're trained to kill. Yeah. You know, like they're, they're trained to deliver a mission. We even saw that last, last episode of The Spectral, you know, like at the end of it all, they just went back out there to war, you know what yeah. I mean? Like soldiers go back out so even if you take aliens and they even if they had some they've got a motivation uh this is our mission take over earth destroy the uh mm-hmm. habitants make it habitable for, for us. us you know that's their job and you can imagine alien politicians sitting back going we won't tell the population that no, we have to we're kill not gonna, seven billion seven million, sentient creatures yeah, because yeah. well they'll, they'll Probably they, accepted, but they might get a bit awkward. It might get so, a bit, you know, uncomfortable them moving there and knowing It'd be no that. different from the six other planets we've done similar yeah. to. But so let's just do it to this one, you know. We want to get elected. we need the resources. We want to get elected next year, yeah, so that's right. we won't tell them about it. We need the whale oil to fund. <laughs> <laughs> no, like we, we don't know. Who knows what they need, These you know. These evil <laughs> aliens that they can come here and kill the humans, kill the whales, kill the whales club the and then, leave. <laughs> and then leave. And then leave. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone wants the whales. Always, I saw Star Trek all those years ago. It was about yeah, the whales, yeah. wasn't it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> that advanced technology and we're coming back for the whales. Maybe yeah, some poor, you know, um, Scandinavian teenage girl sitting there going, but aliens... <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Why the whales? Yeah, poor thing. We tried to argue with the Japanese all these years. Um, any other sites? Or we're pretty happy with that level no, that you've well, gone I was, to? I was going to talk a bit, some interesting research on the Toxo, human performance and, and so forth. So, but I, I mean, I'm not really going to go into that, but there's been a number of studies into the way that Toxo... Plasma gondii causes different hormonal release in our bodies because we know it, it basically screws with the brains of rats, mm. and we highly suspect it does the same for humans in various ways. Right? There's there's studies which link it to depression and bipolar and strongly to schizophrenia. But they're looking and they're going, well, we do know it has certain influences on the dopamine system. 
So there was a research here which was talking about, so basically to paraphrase their, their very abstract bit here and, and you get yourself onto the ncbi.nlm.nih.gov, which is one of these, uh, the National Institutes of Health, big research organization. At the very end it says here, individuals with latent toxoplasmosis show superior behavioral performance in challenging cognitive control situations but may at the same time have a reduced sensitivity towards motivational effects of rewards, which might be explained by the presumed increase in dopamine. Mm -hmm. So what they're saying is they offered monetary rewards for doing, making certain achievements. Mm -hmm. And the people more often with toxo uh, latency, you know, latent toxo infections were less interested in oh. money, in monetary rewards but they were able to uh, concentrate better when the money wasn't the reward. Okay. So it's not really sure what the effect of this is, but yeah, they're sort of saying there's definitely a, a brain difference. So it's, it's quite interesting. And I, I've also read that some other study, that I, and I haven't got it here just now to talk about, but looking at athletic performance, finding that the people with the latent toxoplasmosis train harder. Yeah, right. So, mm. and, and again, these results are not conclusive at mm. all, but they're, they're investigative because they're going, well, uh, a lot of people get infected with this and it has a biological effect. It's just starting to touch into this. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's a fascinating read because we talk, we see a number of science fiction with, with his brain control of various yeah, sorts, or right. there's zombies or this is whatever. And it, it's actually not nearly as bizarre or un, you know, unthinkable as one might think. Yeah, 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 it's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there's that t Netflix show, Santa, was that the Drew Barrymore Santa Clarita Diet? Oh, Santa Clarita Diet. Clarita, that's it, Clarita. I was trying to think how Santa that Santa Claus. Yeah, Santa, Santa Clarita Diet, yeah. <laughs> um, and in oh, that, you know, canceled. she's... Uh, did it? Yeah. yeah. Oh. But, you know, she eats the little thing in the food that then infects her and then she the has, has died. <laughs> the red glands. So she has, you know, so it's probably a bit like that, isn't it? Toxology and... I mean, that film... That, sorry, not a film, TV series. Interesting. I, the one thing I do like in that show is that concept of that... She's a zombie. She's dead, but it's it's done in a totally different way. You know, and it is she's, a black comedy, but she's it's... She's still human. She's still human, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the debate about it's there, but it's... Yeah, she's still human, so that's cool. Have you have you watched that? Huh? So I've got a spoiler. I uh, haven't seen the third season of that. Okay, well, yeah. I shall hold back on any spoilers then. That's a shame because it's quite good. <laughs> I, I do, I do want to keep watching that actually because it's just for a laugh. I, I like it. It is. I, I watch it on the train because my yeah. wife's not that keen on it. Mm. So it's one of my train watching ones. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what about the technicalities of filmmaking? We've spoken a fair bit about the cut and, and the uh, the shaky handy cam mm. and uh, I know there's other things. So, anything I mean, else you want to highlight? Yeah, well, I suppose just on that, I mean, if you take the handheld camera, I think it works really well for low budget films, you know, mm. and TV uh, shows. Again, you know, you want to make a film, uh, what takes a long time is putting a camera on a tripod and the steady shot, you know, and to then move it to another angle, move it to another angle. When you say point of view handheld, well, guess what? You're eliminating all that, you know, it's continuous, it's flowing, it's moving a lot more. Really great for low budget. Classic low budget, world record breaker, in the Guinness Book of Records is the Blair Witch Project. Blair Witch, yeah. You know, and but pretty much three filmmakers. The first of, it's probably well, the first one, but it's the the first one to break the mainstream. Yeah, that's right. And and and, it, and it's a freaky, scary movie. I've never what seen they did. It. Oh seen God, it. you got to sit back with a bucket of popcorn for that movie because it is freaky as and. In that film, they do it really well. And I've got to say, Drew Casson does it very well in this movie in that the fact that the point of view camera is done to the point where, like, it, it makes sense. So what I mean by this is, like, quite often in point of view shot films and TV that I've noticed, even scenes, sometimes a film will have it as a scene, you know, like... The camera does fall on the ground, and you've got this abstract camera, and you, you know, you or or the camera is over there. I think in this film, The Darkest Dawn, and Blair Witch does it the same. They they flow the story with the motion of the point of view very very successfully. You know, we've mentioned a lot about that tonight, and <clears throat> I think he does it really well in this film. And by that I mean, 
yeah, like the helicopters out the window, we're just seeing them in a flash, we're walking past the TV and there's a spaceship on the TV screen. Mm. Um, when they are taken captive by Brian, the first man-man, the kid gets the camera. And, yeah, the kid is shot and the camera falls down. Mm. We don't see the kid dying. But also in that scene, you know, it makes sense. You know, if these guys are madmen and someone walks in with the camera, they're like, and I remember in that scene, Brian's like, what you doing here making a movie? <laughs> you know, like mm. he talks to the camera, you know, and he picks it up. Don't miss a second of this action. You know, this guy's a loony and he wants that. And it's likewise later in the film, Drew uh, does the same technique when it's Hopper. He says, take the camera, film this shit. You know, like, I want you to it's, film these fuckers, you know, this like, you know, like, speaks, like, like to the, the generation as it well. It does, like, it that's does. That's what we do now. Yeah, is. yeah, you know, and, and that selfie shot, like, she, I think, I think before the selfie shot, she's shooting herself going, Mum, you know, I, we've made it out of the tunnels and we're going to go to this location. I'm hoping to see you there. And uh, she, so she's talking, and then, and then she goes into this selfie mode, you know, and it's, it's yes of this generation, but it's telling a story and, and they mm. do it really well. Blair Witch is the same, you know, Blair Witch, three filmmakers go into the woods. Well, they're filmmakers, they've got cameras, they film each other, they're trying to make a film, a documentary, and then things go pear-shaped. Well, they keep filming, you know, they're filmmakers. That's mm. what they, it tells the story. Blair Witch is before vlogging. It's, it's right on the cusp of when the internet was just breaking. I think it's mm. 2000 or 1999, Blair Witch, something like that. And, um, you know, it, it, it was very clever in telling the story at the time for that. Other films I can think of, but Paranormal Activity plays off that handy cam camera in the, in the um, dark. Uh, and um, Cloverfield. This film reminded me of Cloverfield. Have you ever seen that? Yes, Sorry, Cloverfield. Yeah, and so and if you remember, it, two sequels as well. Okay, I've I've not seen the sequels, and it's J J Abrahams. I think is involved in Cloverfield. Yeah, yeah, he does Cloverfield yeah, yeah, I don't know if he's the director, but he's involved in the Cloverfield series. That, yeah. I know now there is a couple, but if you take that first Cloverfield in that, it goes back to VHS cameras, like they're they're video Again, cameras. It's a birthday, and it's a birthday party. Yeah. Um, and I like I liked Cloverfield. I, I enjoyed it, and it's kind of you know it's a big alien thing in the cre- a bit of a Godzilla alien or something isn't it in Cloverfield yeah it's a big alien memory. creature but, and it is it's shot because they're filming a birthday party and this event unfolds as all oh, uh, as that thing so that's another film that does it where it's a video camera and I think again before vlogging and before that so they they played off the idea of just amateur hour you know with cameras you know yeah. Um, so you don't get to see the alien in full and all those sorts of things. So these sorts of things, if you look at a, um, there's some, obviously that's, that was a pretty big Hollywood film actually, Cloverfield, I believe. And Paranormal Activity was another one that was a real low budget. Guy shot it in his house, I believe. Like, like um, 40 grand, 15 yeah, grand. Yeah, 40, 50 grand. Uh, Blair Witch broke the world records because it's, it's, it was made for something like 13, 18 grand, some, something ridiculously low and yet made a couple hundred mil, you know. It just broke everything. Uh, and there's other reasons that we won't talk about for Blair Witch doing that um, tonight. But Paranormal was another one, just, you know, a director, writer, director for many years, just shot it with a couple of actors in his house, I think over a weekend or a couple of weekends kind of thing, you know. So the, it is a medium that works well for low budget, you know, because yeah. you're not doing, you're not so stressed about lighting, you're not so stressed about the particular camera angle. But for it to work, it has to tell us the story successfully, you know, yeah. and it has to be real. I think The Darkest Dawn does it really well. I have seen some films that don't do it well. I've seen some scenes in films that don't do it well. I think they do it really well. I think it is very comparable to Blair Witch, you know, and it's up there. I, I rate The Blair Witch. I think Blair Witch is really good. Um, and if you want to see Hollywood do it, take Saving Private Ryan, take Spielberg's the first 10 minutes of that, or you know, after the old men at the beginning, you know, when we go to war, um, he shot that. He, he actually shot it with uh, what he did for Saving Private Ryan is he, he set up that whole beach scene of Normandy, of the troops coming in. Yeah. And the way they did shoot it was, I think there was something, apparently I've, I've heard him talk about this, where there was four or five cameramen and they were all given licence to just get into the action and shoot it. And they, they staged it all, you know, and they yeah. just shot it like crazy. And uh, the, the the direction from Spielberg was, you're in there, you're a soldier, you're, you know, you're in the troops, you're in the, you're in the trench, you're on the beach, film it for me, you know. And, and it was all sort of unfolded. 
Um, it wasn't done in one take or anything, but it was deliberately done like that. Why did he do that? Well, he wanted us to feel like a soldier arriving on the beach, yeah. right? And that's the thing with point of view. We feel like we are there. That's the, that's the whole point, isn't it? Yeah. We're, the the immediacy, the intimacy, we are there. You know, aliens are here and we're in the chaos. Our dad, Her dad is dead. We're there. We, see, we just saw him get shot right in front of us. We saw a plane go down in front of us. We, we see, you know, someone else murder someone. Like, we are there. We're in, we're in that intense moment. That's the whole point of point of view, you know. Um, it's intimate and it's, it's real. So, yeah, this film does it well. I think this film probably, maybe these guys are doing it really well because they are YouTubers like we talked about earlier. Um, and it does as well add a lot of effect. Once you talk about aliens or Blair Witch, a, a scary witch, uh, the great thing with point of view is, well, we don't get to kind of have that wide shot. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't, don't, we don't, we don't ever really... Sneaking up on them. No, because... we're not the creature because they're the camera, you know, yeah. like we, we are the camera and, and we only get to see what the character sees at all times, you know. And so if they're walking down a tunnel and the alien's behind them, well, we don't know the aliens because they don't know, you know. We only Actually, see what they see, you know. Yeah, so. yeah, say that I just suddenly remembered there's an Australian film called The Tunnel. Yeah, there is, isn't there? Which yes. Which was shot very similar. for... So, yeah, shoestring. Yep. I actually donated some money to it. I was supposed to get some digital stills or something, but I couldn't get the download to work. Right. Uh, it no, doesn't no. matter. Yeah. Yeah, actually, you supported the industry. It was a good movie. Yeah. They actually did an interesting thing because they were doing a filming a documentary of this uh, disused tunnels yeah. in Sydney, which, the, yeah, it's a real place. And they did the trick where they had the, the camera, the handy cam was filming because they're trying to, they're filming areas to get shots set up. And they had the, the main camera as well, mm. which they would then do their main shots. But they put the handy cam down while they were trying to organise something. Yeah. And later on, they're, feel, they're watching back to see what was going on. Yeah. And, and the... you see that something has picked the camera up uh, and is moving it around like, yeah, like it's yeah. not quite sure what it is. But yes. Yeah. It's yeah. really spooky though because yeah. the main guys are setting up the main TV camera because, mm. you know, they've scouted out the area with the... Yeah, the, yeah. This camera, and they set up the main TV camera, and they've left this camera behind. And yeah, something is is in Picking the room with them, <laughs> yeah. looking at this camera yeah, around. Yeah. And again, we can't see the monster because he's holding the it's camera. Holding the camera, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we see where he walks, and and we just watched the scene from the other camera's point mm. of view. And then they're watching it back on this one. Yeah. And yeah, you get, oh, it's, it's that's that, a that, really I think, effective scene. I think that's what Paranormal Activity by Memory does. I haven't seen the sequels of Paranormal Activity. I've seen the first one, which is very rigid with the camera, but at the same time, it's that, it's that effect you're talking about because you're watching these people sleep and, like, door the door opens. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then something, there's footsteps, you know what I mean? Like, so there's something in the room with them, they're asleep. Yeah. And the camera, us, can see it. <laughs> and the, the actors are asleep, so they're in a bit of trouble. So... This film, again, all, playing off point of view is great that way, and this film does it well. I think probably a major other point is the special effects, and we've mentioned it a little bit. Like, I think, you know, it probably was a very low budget. We don't know. Drew yeah. might be able to Drew, let us Drew in. Drew was credited as special effects as yeah, well. Yeah, as well. So Visual effects. So really impressive. He's a talented dude. Uh, one dude doing all this stuff, like, that's, that's very, a hard worker. That's someone is. who is committed to the producing craft. science fiction and... I hope there's a third movie. Yeah. I'm going well, to go, I mean, go back and watch the first one, of course. Yeah, I want to too. I, I didn't... See, again, we didn't know there was... This was sort of sequel, but, mm. you know, the aliens, they are only little bugs and we do only sort of see bits and bods of them, but I think they'll they'll cool little alien bug things. You know, they look work. Um, again, we see the spaceship a couple of various times, blurry. We see it on the TV. We see it in the distance at the end when Adam blows it up. But it, but it, it, but it looks like an impressive spaceship, mm. you know. Um, the sound works well with it. Uh, as I said earlier, like going along the riverbank, the broken, the destroyed, the litter, the helicopters upside down, burnt out, the cars. Like yeah, the, you mentioned the cars being sucked up as well. I mean, all of that special effects, I reckon, were great. You know, like nothing stood out. And I think he was very clever with how he did it. But nothing stood out as, as super digital, you know? Like, no. they were obviously digital, but it, it, it looks realistic the way he did it, you know? I was impressed. Um, so that, that gets a huge, you know, special effects thumbs up. I, we have seen 
budgeted films not be able to pull off what this film does. Yeah, yeah. You know? I, I, um, I was never... I mean, obviously, I was aware that they were going to be special effects because we don't really have spaceships. Yeah. But, I was, for example, the burnt out helicopter, I was thinking they they might actually have put a burnt out helicopter. Yeah, maybe they did, yeah. It's, yeah. You, can, you can get them. Like, it's, yeah. there's um, garbage dumps with yeah, that's helicopters right. and yeah. you just burn them outside and then scorch that does the outside with a torch or something. Cost a lot of money and you've got to crane it in, truck it in, all this sort of stuff. I suspected so it was... Uh, it probably was digital. Digital, you know? but... But it looked good. It, you know, it sat there. Yeah, and then the other thing was, um, I think the plot, uh, we mentioned it right at the start tonight, like, I think the plot... You know, it's an hour and 15, this film, so it's quick. And But the plot is quick. You know, we, we said it at the start, there's only a couple of scenes about Chloe and her family and bam, yeah, the aliens no, are there's here. There's no drawn Chaos, like, time fillers. Yeah, there's no time filler. And, and you know, the, the, the tightening of the plot goes all the way. They're moving, moving, moving. Uh, I never really, I felt tense. I was, I was scared. I was worried. I was enjoying the ride. I love end of the world films really i think it's probably a bit of a personal oh, favorite it, it, and it always it's a fantasy up. you know like it is a fantasy isn't it you know like there's a voyeuristic pleasure in knowing what would you do and it, it probably does lead us to think about what is the point of this film and and these sort of films i don't think there's anything new in this film addressed like i think it's the same that we've seen in many other things take walking dead mm. um take 28 days uh, take any film, you know, Independence Day, any film where it is the end of the world, um, whether it's zombies, aliens, whatever, virus, outbreak, you know, um, these films that are Armageddon films, they always question that, what would you do yeah, in how, the end of the how world? How human would you say? How stay? human would you say? How stay? ruthless yeah. would you get? How caring? And but... this, I mean, like, not to knock the film, it doesn't do anything new in that behalf, but it shows us, I think... Uh, these young people, how they would deal the, with the it. The storytelling style, I think, yeah. is something that's a bit new there. Yeah. Like, I mean, as we said, there's a few other films which do the the handy cam or yeah. what have you, but the editing of this and the speed with which it moved through and the the ease with which it maintained the fiction of the handy cam, I think, is you know, a bit of a standout there. Yeah, I think so. I, I also so. liked actually the the paramilitary way the act of the characters you know, would moving in with their guns and stuff. If you went back 20 years or, or so, you would have said that's ridiculous. Like, they're acting like, you know, special forces. Yeah. But nowadays, uh, I, you know, I've played plenty of computer games. I've also played paintball and so yeah. forth. And you copy, you mimic all of the <laughs> computer game stuff. So, yeah, yeah. So, so this is how people are. I, I know how to do the leapfrogging cover. I know how to, you know... Bre- you know, breach a room and, and you know, uh, slice the pie, as they say. And, you know, I know these terms and I don't, because I've played the computer games mm. and I've had to set up the the plans of my digital characters to do these things. Yeah. And they have little tutorials. So when you breach a room, make sure you have some cup of here, there. And yeah. Don't cross card fire, line of fire and all the rest of it. Yeah. So I quite like that they, you know, Adam came in with the pistol and he's mm. like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And he, and he walked forward like a, like looking like a cop mm. holding a pistol. Yep. Probably because he's played computer games and uh, maybe even played, you know, paintball or, or um, virtual reality type games or something. Mm. He's probably, you know, mucked about pretending in his bedroom as, as some people might do. Yeah, point of view shooting so games. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it is very cool. So, I mean, it, social commentary wise doesn't do anything new, but it... No. it, it does tick all the boxes that we've seen in end of the world films and it, it does it really well that question of you know if you're in that scenario are you like bob are you protecting or you know are you molesting the people that you're looking after are you like hopper and you want to be like uh, power crazy um are you like the captain and want to do the right thing by the whole world uh are you like cohen who wants to you know, we can survive together, you know, let's come together, yeah. uh, you know, and also do you forgive what you have to do? Because Kipper says that, you know, we all we all have done things we and it's what we sort of do about them now, you know, like how we deal with them. So, and all of these sort of end of the world films deal with that. But I loved how this film moved so rapidly and never stopped. Uh, the pauses were appreciated, but then it got on. You know, it never held yeah, back. It, it didn't have a lot of films. It, you get like that, that 
pause to have the, the B story, the yeah, romance Yeah, yeah, and then you have the romance, you have the making oh, out, and all that sort of stuff. And isn't it the worst and... part where it's like, uh, we've got three minutes to yeah. save the world. Yes, but there's something I have to tell you. <laughs> That's right. What? What is it? Tell well, I've me. I've always loved you, well, sorry. <laughs> let me tell you. Like, you, you sit there yeah. and go, fucking move it. Yeah, that's what right. are you doing? That's right. Press so, the button already. <laughs> you know, we saw it with, uh, you know, Cersei's, you know, she gets her little love tr- love moment at the end of her life. You know, like, I think this film probably would laugh at that idea because it's like, no, you... Aliens have invaded, man. Yeah. <laughs> the world is stuffed. We don't have time for the cheesy endings. You you survive or you don't, you know, like it's not so Hollywood. And and I think we appreciate this. And, and again, I think it speaks to probably the generation at the, at the moment. So it brings us to the end. Uh, we've talked about The Darkest Dawn. Darkest Dawn. It's a great 2016 film. It's available on Netflix, uh, directed by Drew Casson and also written by Jess Cleverly. Both star in the film with a bunch of you know, superstar YouTubers that you should Google and check out. I'm, I'm really interested in checking out these people. Yeah, Plus, I, I know. I'm looking at that going, I want to, like, Bob. Yeah. He's a, he's a comedian. He's a comedian. He does yeah. YouTube typically about food and yeah. toys and yeah. stuff. Sounds and pretty to, funny. I'm trying to marry that <laughs> with, with his, angry Bob. He's a bit of an angry personality there. Yeah. And, and that other dude, Hopper. Again, likewise, he, he he's, a clown, does, he's a trained clown, you know. He like, just, well, yeah. He's a clown, all right. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. And I thought, you know, yeah, it was great. And um, Chloe's played by Beth and, Beth and Mary Leadley, I think, um, uh, or Ledley. I'm not too sure. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, so if Beth wants to uh, come on and correct us, by all means, we always Please, ask our we actors love. that we ruin <laughs> their pronunciation of their <laughs> names. Right. We're Australians. Pronunciation is not our thing, I don't think. But, um, yeah, let us know what you thought about The Darkest Dawn. Please go and watch it. And, well, apparently the film before it, Hunterford. Is that is that right, Hunterford? Hung- Hungerford. 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 So I'm going to go check that out. We're not going to review it next episode, but uh, we, maybe in the future. But uh, I want to go check, check it out. Yeah, on my phone, on the train. Yeah, definitely sounds good. And maybe it is a phone film like this one. What's next week, dude? Well, I believe it's on my list and it's a film called Revolt, which oh, I have no. Nothing, no understanding of what it is. That a man who has to eat a plate of snails <laughs> and maggots. There we go. And it's Revolt. It's Revolt. That's Revolting. Uh, oh, maybe not. Well, the little picture has... Robotic aliens or something. Ro- I'm yeah, not too robots sure. And, ex- and like shiny things. But again, we go in joy watching, don't we, uh, Surrey? So it's we go in a good with a, a big smile on our face, not knowing anything about it and looking for the best bits. So I'm looking forward to it. Let us know what you've thought on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Reach out, like us, comment, share, talk about us, talk to us. Check out my new book, This Is My Exit Plan. It's on Amazon. Yes, please do. And, uh, yeah, till next time, the Space Brains will be here again. Ciao. See ya. (laughs)